it's conflict and it's compromise. And it's just, it's new every time. It's brand new every night. It's very, very exciting. And it's dying. It's dying, Mia. It's dying on the vine. And the world says, let it die. It's had its time. Well, not on my watch. Wow, that sounds a lot like the writing of a, a um, someone that we might have seen in one of his movies lately. Uh, maybe a Damon Chazelle, and that being his uh, second movie, La La Land. Oh, my God. You, sir. Hold on. McDing in. You're correct. Ka-ching! Welcome to episode 20 of the Average Joe's Movie Clubcast. This is Justin. And I'm Joey. And on this episode, we may be eager to get season one over with, and I think Joey might be eager to get this movie conversation over with, as we will be chatting about some guys that are kicking and screaming to stay in college as we check out Noah Baumbach's debut movie from 1995 of the na- that same namesake. Plus, with Easter right around the corner, we're going to be talking to us some Jesus when we... Uh, We'll be uh, talking about Martin Scorsese's passion project film, The Last Temptation of Christ from 1988. And always, we are going to go into full detail about all these movies. So um, if there's one you haven't seen and are interested in, you don't want any spoilers, just skip ahead a little bit so you can, you know, be spoiler free. Nice. And if you want to be a part of the club, make sure to hit that subscribe button. Leave us a comment. We would love to hear from you. Hopefully our community is growing. Uh, we're trying. We're trying here. You know, we came in, came into this with the mindset of like, yeah, let's just talk about movies online. But, you know, a couple people are listening. So uh, we'd love to hear from you. And, um, and if it feels like we're rushing through our normal show, it might be because we just got about an hour in and all of a sudden the computer froze and everything we had talked about just went away. So, we are still going to deliver you this first <laughs> part of the show, but it might be a little brisker than usual. Maybe not our same casual pace. Yeah, we'll try to we'll try to keep it normal, but we might go through some stuff that <laughs> we've already went through. Yeah, we'll cut some of the fat. So, week three of quarantine. I've been stuck in my house with my kids wanting to play Fortnite and not doing their homework for three weeks. And it's, oh, just how it sounds. So, how's your life? Um, well, let's see. At work, uh, no one can come in except for us. So, that's kind of cool. It's also a little annoying because people walk up to the door. There's a giant sign that says no one inside but employees. And people still want to come in. And then they get pissed off. They can't use cash. But for the most part, I think they've gotten oh. used to it. Um, and then at home, I watched a few more movies than I had been watching and playing some Dark Souls. That's... That's really about it. Um, I've been trying to read a little bit, but I'm back behind on that. I need to get uh, caught back up on that. So we'll we'll see if I can squeeze that in somewhere as well. The reading, you say? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, the girl with the dragon tattoo. Oh. Have you seen the movies? Uh, I've seen the the Daniel Craig one uh, last year. It was in my top ten. Um, and mm-hmm. I want to watch uh, all the other ones as well. I just haven't as of yet. Nice. Yeah, I didn't know you were into the books. Um, um, I hadn't been in quite some time. I'm trying to get back into it. Yeah, I I, I'll, I'll, I sound like a uh, a heathen, but if, if if I'm gonna if if I'm gonna get it dive into a book, it'll probably be on tape. I just 
don't make any time to sit down and read. I mean, I kind of read for a living. Like I'm a writer, so I'm like constantly reading and writing stuff. So maybe that's the reason that I just kind of want to watch stuff and uh, avoid the subtitle films sometimes. So hey, maybe there's maybe there's something to that. Maybe so. And, and, and I don't want avoid subtitle films. It's the fact that if you've lived in, if you've heard the show before, if a dub's available, I'll go from it. Shame, uh, I'll go for it. Go, go for it. Shame on me. Um, anyways, that's a whole digression. Um, all right. Well, so what have I been doing? Um, yeah, Just trying to watch as many movies as possible. Got a few more John Hughes movies in. Um, trying to get all his catalog in. Um, now I only have two left: Curly Sue and his other one. Um, it's, um, some about a wedding. Let me figure that out real quick. Um, while you're looking that up, I did also um my. Uh, my buddy Danny made this uh, D&D like game that we started playing so I'm looking forward to that we got one session in uh, last Friday so I'm looking forward to keep playing that too oh I didn't uh, realize great. you played D&D interesting um, well I'm uh, this will be like my second campaign this is like a it was a D&D style game it's not exactly D&D but um, I started a campaign last year uh, with uh, both my roommates and a couple of uh, our other friends, and it uh, we didn't finish it. It just sort of ended, unfortunately. Like Christmas killed it, and then we tried to start back, and then um, work and all of that, and it just sort of ended. And now we wouldn't be able to play anyway. But I mean, I guess we would do the same thing we were doing um, for us to play Friday night, where we played over Discord. But oh. yeah, she's having a baby. That's the other one I haven't seen. Back in 1988, back in his heyday, before, yeah, in the 90s, his he kind of went downhill with some of his screenplays, like Home Alone 3. But, um, yeah, Curly Sue and She's Having a Baby. Once I watch those two, I'll be done watching all those John Hughes directed movies. Um, I saw, yeah, I've just been in this, like, wholesome movie mode ever since the last show. And so I watched Uncle Buck. That was a good time. Nice bit of sentimentality. Uh, in my letterbox review, I kind of went all into the fact that, you know, John Candy was like one of my childhood, like favorite, favorite dudes. Yeah. He lost him way too soon. And then I saw his, um, and I loved, um, the great outdoors growing up, him and Dan Aykroyd, but that movies seems like they took a few shortcuts on that. I wish Hughes would have directed that one as well. Maybe that one would have felt a little bit more cohesive. And yeah, last week I was, um, yeah, last week I was into the my other my other film clubs, which I have two different ones on Letterboxd. Um, one we kind of watch more serious stuff, and another we watch uh, kind of more fun stuff. And so I packed in another uh, three-hour Russian epic. Um, basically, it, it's called Hard to Be a God. It's all about like basically how miserable it was to be in Russia back in the middle middle um, in the Middle Ages, and the show you the difference um the other guy recommended dread so i revisited that and uh that was a really good time i watched that with another action movie that i'll be talking about here in just a few minutes but moving right along all right you know what these two movies are but we'll have to for the for the sake of the show would you this is our movie night pick'em game and team america world police or basketballs what would you rather watch um well because these were both on Joey's uh, half star list. Shock and awe, everybody! <gasps> you would put oh. Team America, the wor- one of the worst movies you've ever seen. <gasps> maybe not now after actually having watched some really terrible movies. Maybe I would give it like a star. But that movie was <laughs> god awful, uh, god awful trash. And the only thing worth a damn that came out of it was America. Fuck yeah. I would pick basketball, if nothing else, because it has Yasmin Belief and Jenny McCarthy, and at least I could look at something. Yeah. Um, but neither one of these movies are good. I would just rather watch South Park, either big or longer, uncut, or the TV show. Mm-hmm. Um, but both both those movies were just real bad. Like I'm looking at the like the the movie picture on Letterbox of this, and it's so bad. Like. As a teenager, yeah, I would have loved this picture as they're both just holding giant baseballs as balls. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, no, nah, as a teenager, I would have laughed uncontrollably and thought this was the greatest thing ever. 
Nice. But no, it's it, it, it's so bad. All right. So let's get into what we've been watching lately with the good, the bad, and the ugly. All right. So my lineup is, now that's funny. Yeah, it's silly, but it's still awesome. And I grew up with it. And finally a criterion that lived up to its awesome looking cover. What you got? I've got the good guy, the badass, Mm -hmm. and the ugly. All right. So what you want to hear about first? Uh, Now that's funny. All right. So after now, so I've been into these wholesome movies. And so there was this um, on Facebook, like, so we don't have March Madness. So these guys came together with this whole huge comedy bracket deal on Facebook that people have been voting for. And so many people have been obsessed with this movie Spaceballs, which I remember watching as a kid and just thinking that wasn't funny at all. Garbage. Um, how did it get so far? Oh my yeah. God. How did it beat Lebowski? Why isn't Lebowski the winner? Okay, I've had my diatribe continue. <laughs> so yeah, Spaceballs, not a fan of this movie whatsoever. You know, back in the episode where we were talking about fanboys, it's just something about Star Wars parody that just doesn't click with me. Although, afterwards, I checked out my favorite Mel Brooks film, um, History of the World Part 1, and that thing had me cracking up laughing throughout the whole thing. So sometimes comedy works for you, sometimes other ones don't. So, But yeah, that one holds up 100%. Definitely recommend checking that out, especially if you're somewhat of a history buff like I am. Um, yeah, the opening sequence is, uh, well, I'll, I'll say the line that someone sold me the movie on back when I was in high school where Mel Brooks is Moses and he comes out and he has these three tablets and he's like the 15 come oh and he drops it he's like the 10 commandments so uh, it's just jam-packed with all these gags I I had a I had a great time watching that and uh reading about it so yep gonna be watching some more Mel Brooks coming up there's a few ones I haven't seen before that was one part that was good about space balls was there's actually a kind of a meta scene where they show like the whole like Mel Brooks uh, filmology there on the shelf and like VHS cases I'm like oh I haven't seen silent movie and I haven't seen to be or not to be so uh yeah kind of put a uh, movie uh cover to those titles that I haven't seen all right what is your ugly my ugly was PMS cop. Um, <laughs> so not going to front went into it knowing that it was going to be bad, but kind of thought that maybe it would be so bad. It would at least be entertaining. Um, you know, scrolling through the watch list on Amazon prime. And it was like, all right, this is like the fourth movie. Don't really want to scroll anymore. Sounds potential. And that was it. It was schlock with potential. It was garbage. A uh, woman cop stops a rapist, beats the shit out of him, gets caught on camera um then they're like hey maybe you should apologize and she's like yeah next time i'll just shoot the motherfucker and they're like oh you need Mm. to go to counseling and the counselor was like well is it because you were on pms and she was like uh no and then they make her take this uh experimental drug and it has a tracker in it and it turns out it was like a failed military experiment and then she goes crazy and starts killing people and they're trying to stop her and it's like oh it has military exploit you know it's going to be so good for the military. It'll make all this money and blah, 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 blah. And then they even use a different actress. And like, this is a movie that probably could use gratuitous TNA and it had no gratuitous TNA. And it was bad plot, bad acting, bad, just everything. So, and I, so was it like a female like empowerment like kind of thing or what, what what was what was the audience for this if you could guess um oh, okay so normally we, we we know that i like movies where there's a strong female lead which yep. has had a female lead killing the living shit out of people it, men women didn't really care it killed everybody she killed everybody but uh i i i <laughs> The, the, the audience would have I've been people who like trash movies, I guess. Um, cause that's, I, I don't foresee any, anything else other than this, that, it, that they could have been going for was that it was, uh, just a trash movie. Um, 
This just, is currently my worst rated movie for this year. And as I don't plan on going through the 10 worst, uh, uh, like 10 worst movies of all time list. Like I did last year mm-hmm. again, this year, it'll probably be hard pressed to be beat as my worst movie of the year. So <laughs> is the, is there an appeal with, uh, what's the appeal of watching bad movies? Is there one? I mean, sometimes, sometimes you can get a movie that's so bad that it's good or, you know, yeah, like, I don't know. Have you seen the room? I enjoyed the room. I mean, I'm glad I saw it, especially it kind of enhanced watching the disaster artists. I, I definitely like the, everything around the room. Pro, um, yeah, that's definitely a bad movie. Um, like, I, I mean, I've heard troll two is like one of the bad, the worst movies. Oh, and God, God. Troll I just, two, <laughs> that was one of the ones I watched last year. So it's like some, like, so I guess it's one of those things. So like, say like me, you, Carl, and like, you know, I, I, I don't know. You know, like my friend Rosa is usually over here. So say like all of us sat down and, you know, you sit there and you like talk shit about it or something while you're watching it. It's a good uh-huh. time. But like the movie itself is usually atrocious. Um, but like the room, I brought that up uh, specifically because, you know, someone, you know, might say something and I'll just be like, I don't want to talk about it. Or I or I did not hit her. I did not. Or, you know, they'll <laughs> say something. Like, Hi, uh-huh. Mark. And it's like as bad as the movie is, like because it's so bad, it has like quotable moments. Um, yeah, so bad it's good. And I don't really yeah. have that crowd where I could kind of watch a movie like that. So yeah, I could no, see. No. Uh, that yeah, one's not totally so different. bad. As, it's not bad as good. Like we're still just making fun of it. Um, or like Bird Dimmick had fucking clip art CGI, and so someone's like, "Bro, this movie has really bad CGI." And I'm like, mm, "No, no, it really doesn't." And mm-hmm. like. That's a whole other tangent. I don't. I'm not going to go on. So, but yeah, it, it's just like I thought this one would have been like, oh, this is actually a bad movie, but you know, it's got action and it'll have you know this woman killing people, and it'll probably be entertaining. You know, it'll be the low the low side of the you know what I've watched this year, but it'll still be entertaining. And it, it just wasn't. It, it it was, it was bad, like real bad. All right. So. What would you like to hear about next? Uh, we'll do. Yeah, it's silly, but it's still awesome. All right, pop quiz, hotshot. There's a bomb on a bus. Once the bus goes 50 miles an hour, the bomb is armed. If it drops below 50, it blows up. What do you do? What do you do? Bum 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 bum. Yeah, I watched Speed again. It's been forever since I watched this. I watched this countless times as a kid. This was like one of the original Blu-rays I first got, and I finally popped it in the player, and boy, this guy, this this movie is just as good as I remember. Good old Keanu Reeves, uh, your favorite Dennis Hopper, Sandy, uh, Sandra Bullock. I mean, 25 minutes into the movie, and we're only done with the intro, which was awesome, where like this elevator is getting blown up, and they're going to save people out of that, then they finally go to the bus sequence, nonstop action, they finally escape the bus. And they get on a speeding train, and they got to escape that too. And for some reason, Keanu says, we got to speed up the train to jump the tracks, if that makes any sense. Man, this movie's so much fun. I don't care that it's silly. It's still one of my favorites. I'd watch that movie. Like Someone's like, yeah, let's watch some speed. Brother, let's go. Early 90s Keanu is like the jam. I guess I need to... He's in Point Break too, right? That's one of your faves? Oh, yes. I love some Point Break Keanu and Swayze, like let's go. <laughs> All right, what's your um, bat? You had a badass one, right? Yes, I have the badass. That is female prisoner number seven oh one Scorpion. Um, so this stars uh Mieko Kaji, um, which she's also uh more probably well known for being uh Lady Snowblood. So. Basically, the the lady that influenced the bride in Kill Bill, um, also Oren Ishii to a degree, but um, so she's in prison, um, and she is basically tortured, raped, beaten in prison after being betrayed by this police officer. Oh, um, sounds up like it's up your alley. Yeah, so it's a it's a 1970s a women in prison exploitation movie. So gratuitous TNA, but you know, there's actually 
good camera work. There's a good score. They're revenge. Uh, and the, you know, the warden just wants to murder her. The other women turn on her. And then she is it, it basically is not a bitch to be trifled with. Um, there's a scene where she is hogtied hmm. and she still manages to drop this pot of like boiling soup on this other prisoner's face while she's hot. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. You don't mess with her. Um, so it came in an era box set, uh, that my roommate picked up, uh, like he pre-ordered it, got it during the criteria, not the criterion, the arrow sale. Um, so like four, these four really high quality Blu-rays for like 30 bucks. Um, and so we've watched two of the four so far. Um, so looking forward to watching the last two and, and just delving into the to the rest of it. So um, definitely, if you're into that kind of stuff, highly recommend it. All right, my last one is finally a Criterion that lived up to its awesome uh, cover. So yeah, from the history on our show, we've done what Ashes and Diamonds, and we're like, eh, that's all right, great cover, kind of an okay movie. And then we watched Army of Shadows. We were both pretty. Pretty down on that one. Also an awesome cover. But I've had this movie, Confession, which for some reason is out of print. It hadn't been out on the Criterion all that long, but for some reason it's out of print. Um, yeah, called The Confession. I'm a sucker for um, Cold War, um, Soviet era kind of uh, movies. I have a list on Letterboxd that says um, you had me sold at uh, Russia. So I have all like these Russian movies that I love. Um, American and actual Russian movies. But this one is about a communist uh, party leader in um, Czechoslovakia. And one day he basically just gets abducted. And it's all about like the part, these these officials like, you know, really wearing on him, trying to make him do this, um, make him confess to these crimes. And he doesn't even understand why he's there. Um, and it's all part of like the Stalin regime. So you might have heard that like Stalin sent like all these political prisoners to like gulags. And it was just this whole era of like paranoia, really kind of the, the cream of the crop in terms of, you know, why the, the Soviet state was so corrupt. And so that's what this movie depicts. Um, yeah, it's a great ride. I'm glad I finally checked it off my box, enjoyed it quite a bit. And yes, it has this great cover that's like red and has this guy, this really jarring looking guy with his jaw and you see this uh, Soviet star in his mouth. And uh, yeah, that's a really good one to check out. French film. Yep. So you, you got one more to go, right? You got your yes. good. Yeah. The good guy. Right. And that is Conan the barbarian. So somehow I made it all the way to 2020, 34, almost 35 years old without seeing Conan the Barbarian. I don't know how, but I did it. So, is this movie a technical masterpiece? No. Did it win any awards? Hell no. Was this movie freaking awesome? Yes. Uh, you've got just Arnold jacked out of his gourd, you know, in the 80s. Uh, you've got swords, you've got girls, you've got a strong female lead in uh, Valeria, and they're just kicking ass. We've got swords, wizards. I mean, it's basically like D&D, &D, but in a movie. And then the bad guy is Darth Vader, but, you know, not Darth Vader. He's some, he's a man snake, a snake man, whatever. <laughs> snake Lord or something. Yeah, he's a snake Lord. He's Lord Voldemort. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it's cheesy, it's dumb, but there's, yeah, it's all these things, plus lots of blood. Like, it's just, it's everything you could want in, like, a sword and sorcerer movie. And, you know, if you're into to that kind of stuff, it's it you, yeah just just and you somehow haven't seen this movie then yeah you should you should go watch it like i said you're not going to get world class dialogue obviously it's arnold you know his accent is super thick but you don't need it there's just they're going to fight and they're going to kill shit and it's it's fantastic highly recommend all right now to our final feature movie club pick for this season we have Will Ferrell's immortal classic from 2005, Kicking and Screaming. No, that's an April Fool's joke, but I don't think Joey wants it to be. We're actually talking about Noah Baumbach's uh, debut film, which is spine number 349 in the Criterion Collection. Even this transition sounds like underwhelming <laughs> for some reason. I mean, um, I was kicking and screaming the whole time I watched this movie, for what it's worth. Uh, oy vey. Um... 
I think that was a better transition than that lame ass joke you just tried to write in there, brother. Oh, I tried. It's April Fools. I mean, and they had the same name. It it came with the territory. I had to That's, go for the. They do. Although one is kicking and screaming, and one is kicking ampersand screaming. Like, come on, Justin. Jeez. <laughs> You're giving this one the asterisk. <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, <laughs> I gotta bust you up a little bit, man. Come on. I, th- this cover did look a little. I mean, this cover. I mean, it's it's pretty. It's striking. I mean, you have the green, and I didn't realize those were like bubble quotes, like all around the side. I didn't see that until later. And it's just this k- kicking and screaming in these funky letters. I thought it was a pretty solid cover. I was excited to see this, and I, I really enjoyed it. Uh, Joey, not so much. All right. So, um, yeah, Noah Baumbach. Uh, I don't think you've seen any of his films, right? Yeah, this is the this is the only one of his that I've seen currently. I really. Um, have been excited to watch uh, Marriage Story, especially knowing that this one uh, was coming up and I just haven't got around to it. And also, I mean, I, I don't think it's a secret that uh, I love Scarlett Johansson and I'm also a really big fan of Adam Driver. Um, I've, I've only seen him in, in, I think, in three movies, but um, I, I want, there's a couple more that I want to see him in being uh, Marriage Story and like Logan Lucky and I just haven't seen him yet. So um, even with the... Not being a huge fan of this movie, um, I'm still really looking forward to Marriage Story. So Nice. I've seen a few of his films now. I've seen um, Francis Ha. My first one was Squid and the Whale. I actually saw that back in the movie theater um, when it came out. I've seen Marriage Story, and now I've seen his debut feature. Kicking and Screaming. Um, I feel like I've seen, I should see more of his movies. Probably Marowitz, um, Marowitz Stories is probably on the radar. And I think he did Greenberg want to see that one as well but he's actually uh he is he's a couple with uh, greta gerwig and uh, you've seen some of her movies and he was one she was the star of uh, francis ha so a little connection there all right so why did i like kicking and screaming so when i was watching this movie i was just like gosh what genre would you consider this and what i kind of came up with was this is for me this is an intellectual banter kind of movie which for me is kind of comfort food like I love just kind of cozying up to a movie like this and just kind of hanging out with these people, listening to their fun, um, you know, their whatever little romance or um, comedy they get into. I mean, you have the whole range. You have movies like this where it's a bunch of people that, you know, think they're smarter than shit um, talking. And then you have movies like Clerks where they're just talking about a bunch of dirty stuff. I mean, the and then there's a movie called Slacker where you're just kind of essentially following around a bunch of like artsy people around austin texas uh it doesn't matter i just i guess i just love conversation i think we actually had that um wasn't it you that i was talking about in um college and you just were baffled that i was into talk talk radio i mean possibly um because i mean you mean like npr specifically no back then i was mostly into like colin cowherd and that like sports talk radio i've never been into npr um but i but like i never listen to music on the way to like work or whatever i'm always either listening to like a book on tape or like um a podcast or stuff like that i just rather be listening to like things than like just like music um I mean, maybe, but like, I really was into sports talk radio for a while. It might've been after, might've been after that, but I mean, I definitely listened to a lot of Cowherd for a while and like, mm-hmm. uh, uh, the, the Greeny and Golick, um, I listened, uh, so oh, yeah. whatever I listened to them for a while. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I've gotten into a few podcasts, uh, mostly movie ones since we started doing this. Um, but generally speaking, if I drive somewhere and I put on Spotify, um, just like for music and, mm-hmm. and go. So nice. So, um, yeah. So the premise of this movie is essentially, uh, so the name is kicking and screaming. And what that gets down to is the fact that you have these, these 20 somethings and they're all done with college, but they don't want to, they don't want to break up the band. They want to, they want to hang out. They want to keep going, hooking up with freshman girls and, going to parties, go to their favorite pub, listen to, uh, you know, the guy that's been there seven years longer than they have, um, you know, spew his, his, uh, intellectual, whatever. (laughs) Um, so yeah, it's that movie where these guys just don't want to leave college. They want to just hang out and be buds still. 
And um, yeah, that's kicking and screaming. Live the good old college life. Now me, I can't relate to that necessarily since like I was engaged at the end of uh, college and whenever I was done graduating, I had a, a two week timer. You get a job with benefits right now or you're going to keep looking and looking and looking. And so that was actually a really stressful time in my life. I did not get to be Dustin Hoffman and the graduate uh, chilling out in a pool. Um, so I kind of have the nostalgia of like looking at a movie like this, thinking like, yeah, what if I did have a more kind of laid back after college life to where I was just kind of hanging out in the, in the college town, just, you know, maybe working a small job, not doing anything significant and just kind of living life. Um, so I kind of enjoy watching other people do that. Um, a movie like this, like you don't have to be invited to the party. You can just pop in the DVD or the Blu-ray and, you know, watch this kind of stuff. And, um, yeah, I, I find that comforting. Um, I'm also more of a, a home buddy than a socialite. So, uh, you have that as well. So, <laughs> I mean, we're all home bodies right now. So yes. In the quarantine. Yeah, exactly. Everybody is living the, the Justin Peterson, uh, chill, chill and, oh, what's it? Netflix and chill. All right. Something and, like that. Um, or at least they should be. <laughs> I'm all, I'm not I'm all okay. So the the whole rage is this whole like tiger thing on Netflix, and yeah, I have no desire to watch that whatsoever. Is is that something that comes up in your? Because because give give the folks a little bit of background on. I mean, you you kind of live like one of these guys essentially, but you're a lot older than them, and you're not as douchey, right? <laughs> I mean, yes, we have uh, three three single guys in our condo. Um... <laughs> So, yeah, um, but, you know, we, I mean, I think that's where the similarities end. Um, you know, we're not, <laughs> we're not trying to, you know, stay in college. There's two of us that are, you know, that are our age, you know, mid thirties. Yeah. And then you got the one who's, who's 22 and that cr- kind of creates some, some interesting situations sometimes as, you know, we're like, yo, what the fuck are you doing? And he's just like. Oh, I wasn't paying attention or whatever. And, you know, that's not me trying to be a douche about it or anything. It's just what happens. You know, he's, he's still our friend, we, you know, but it's just like, God, I hope that I wasn't like that at 22 and 23. I probably was, but Jesus Christ, I, I really, really hope that I wasn't. Um, yeah. So, so there's, there's a couple of characters in here that really stood out to me. Uh, the Czech character, he, I guess he has red hair. He's a bartender. Um, I know we've 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 briefly had this conversation already, but uh, <laughs> uh, for me, it reminds me of a guy we went to college with um, named Dave. I won't um, say his last name, but he had been there for quite a while. I think he changed majors a couple of times, which is the reason why he hung on in college way more than the four year or five year uh, general sense. Uh, no grad, not grad school or anything like that. So you have uh, Chet. He's <laughs> I get. He had he had kind of a uh, an interesting little speech he did where he was like just saying how kind of describing how he was like a student he just wanted to learn and um, I don't know I mean I I've referred to him as douchebags and I could see in a sense how you would think they're pretentious but I mean these I I could totally see myself hanging out with these guys so I didn't have a problem with them at all and I enjoyed watching them um, unfortunately. Uh, the character Otis is probably the one I would relate to the most. And the only thing I wouldn't relate to for sure is the fact that he like refused to leave because he's like, Oh, I have a schedule and I can't leave. But yeah, it's, it's all of this concept about don't want to break up the band, but I got a kick out of the fact that like, he'd be like one of the first ones that ding in and do their little trivia games or like sitting at a bar naming like how many Jason movies can you name? He brings his big old martial arts poster to uh, the airport. I think it was from, the Chow Young fat on there, probably, you think? I mean, yeah, it definitely looked like it could have been Chow Young or like a John Woo poster or something, but it was just really weird that it was like, I'm going to check onto this plane, this framed poster, and this like Mac 3 computer or whatever. It was like the whole computer that you could just pick up and carry. It was like, uh, brother, I don't think oh, you yeah, can check that's right. that. I forgot. I think that's an Apple II, maybe. I don't know. Something like that. Yeah, it's like, I don't think you can check those. Um, but sure, yeah, you just you do you. Um, and I yeah. thought I thought I was in a real, kind of my whole like 
notes on this film would be all based on like the, the quotes and although they do have a lot of memorable lines yeah i think it's definitely characters and moments that kind of stick in my mind the most mostly so is this adorable uh girl jane um yeah i just i kind of find a fell in love with her almost instantly she has this little quirk where she's like constantly kind of like playing like with her mouth she's like she keeps taking her um retainer out and she has this cutest smile and she even has this thing where she'll come up to like the guy she's dating the next day and like they have a literature class and um she'll like have like a retort to whatever he said so i thought that was that was pretty great um now this is in a flashback scene and it's before they're dating in the flashback scene and right. throughout the majority of the movie they're not dating they're broken up and separated uh, yeah because <laughs> yeah homeboy won't shit or get off the pot because <laughs> she keeps calling him from Prague and is like i miss you and i i don't know why i'm calling you blah 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 and he won't call her back and he's just <sighs> yeah it wasn't until i rewatched this movie and and like saw her again at the beginning talking about like you know why won't you go with Prague with me that yeah, I totally didn't realize there was these flashbacks in this movie for some reason. So, yeah, like, I guess it might have been the disconnect of, like, in the beginning she's wearing a dress and then we see her again and she's a barista and I just did not put that together. So, shame on me. But, um, but yeah, I, I did notice the little stylistic thing that they put in there. And I guess now that I see it in hindsight, I guess maybe that's how Bombach was kind of hinting that this was a flashback he would do like these little still frame things sometimes he would do like a still frame and then it would move a little forward and then another still frame and this was bomb box like first feature so i was just thinking he was getting like his french new wave stylistic uh -huh -huh vibe on but uh, i guess that might have had a purpose that i just totally missed which i'm pretty ashamed about I'm, i usually catch things like this but not this time I mean, I wouldn't have picked up on that. I'm not I don't really noticed, uh, know about French New Wave. I just was like, hey, they're together now and they're back in school. So this must be, well, I guess not they're not together, but they're back in school and they're being all like flirty. So this must mm -hmm. be in the past, uh, contextual clues. Yeah, I think your roommate Carl, he watched Breathless recently, right? Did he tell you about that one? Mm, that sounds right. But uh, not 100%. Yeah, that's one of those Godard, New Wave, uh, New Wave French ones. Uh, Quentin Tarantino, there's some good uh, YouTube videos about Quentin Tarantino talking about like his love of Godard and the French New Wave. So yeah, that's something to check out at some point. Uh, another character that stood out to me is you have this uh, Euro guy who's like, yeah, I'm from Europe, I'm so cool, and like all the girls are on him. Um, and I can say that that doesn't go both ways when you're in Europe because... Well, I study abroad for a semester in Sweden, and the place I went, I mean, there was a lot of exchange students, and like I said, I'm kind of a home buddy. So, but, I mean, I had, shoot, why, I, I'm kind of downplaying the best time of my life there. I traveled all over Europe and met all kinds of kind of cool people. But, um, and I actually did, whenever I was over there, I learned that, you know, it's not Czechoslovakia anymore, it's the Czech Republic and Slovakia. And, um, but the, this whole movie, they're, ta they're calling it Czechoslovakia, but it's not until like he's having this conversation with his dad, which is dad who's played by what Elliot Gold. Yeah. Which we saw him a few films and back. This, and this is Grover specifically. Grover. Right. Um, yeah. He wants, he's like, son, I think we should get together and talk about the Knicks. I'm not so sure if they're going to have a good season or whatever it is. And, um, and he's just like, son, it's 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 the Czech Republic. It's not Czechoslovakia. So it's like, oh, I'm not crazy. Okay, they had broken that, broken up by that point, um, the country that is. So, but uh, did you reckon? Did you do you know what Noah, Noah Baumbach looks like now? Uh, well, yeah, because uh, he was the, the dude on the the counter. Hey, would you rather fuck a goat or a fuck a cow? Excuse me, or um, lose your mother. And then homeboy was helping his girlfriend, who was a senior now, move in. Got all pissy. And their whole relationship was a train wreck, like the whole time. Oh. Yeah, I wasn't. I wasn't into her much, and yeah, he was kind of in and out the whole time. He, that's the guy. It's just like, man, I'm just gonna re-roll in school. You know, screw you guys. Yeah, he was very. 
much a side character in this. Um, uh, he re-enrolled so he could be near his girlfriend. He seemed like he was a jealous douche canoe. Oh, that's right. Because wasn't she kind of being flirty <gasps> with the the Euro guy? Or the Euro guy was flirty with her, or, and yeah, they were like friends like or whatever. And then, you know, she cheated on him with, I think, one of his friends, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, I... I, I get all that mixed. Mix, I do recall like the scene where like didn't she write on like a like a notebook a pet paper where she's like I cheated on you or something and he's just yeah like, and they got in the big fight and he was like she was like just leave but then they go to the bar later and he was like he told his one friend he's like our friendship is now concluded because mm-hmm. yeah I don't know. it's a lot of uh these guys really enjoy wearing their sports coats yeah. <laughs> yeah well you know if they're up near new york they can kind of do that um down here it's too hot for that yeah and then uh otis the guy i were like relate with although i'm pretty sure i would tell the waitress even if she looks like she's having a bad bad day that there there's a cheeto floating in my beer not not a cheese fry or a chicken wing as he describes it but uh, clearly a cheeto that has the buoyancy to ha- stay on top of a beer as such and um yeah i don't recall ever being that guy sitting in an apartment that i don't know anybody drinking a malt liquor but i think i hooked up with a friend one time and we decided hey we're gonna we're gonna drink some malt liquor tonight and see what that's all about <laughs> i don't know if it was mad dog 2020 or what but um malt liquor up. all hmm. right yeah i'll pass on that thank you very much uh, speaking of um talking about Knicks basketball that was something I was constantly talking about back in college um it's college football for sure remember always waking up early to watch uh, game day and um yeah I mean that that's still kind of your your thing right I mean I love college football but um I work like every Saturday during college football season so um I can catch game day and I can usually catch like, uh, like an hour of a game usually. And then I have to dip out. So, um, yeah, I don't really get to watch a lot of it. I might can catch, you know, most of the, like the big prime time game when I get home or something, or like, like a crazy late West coast game or something. But, Mm -hmm. you know, luckily the last few years, my team has been, uh, in the, a lot of the prime time games. So I can catch most of them, but, yeah, a lot of times the games are over by the time, you know, I get home and it's almost halftime and it's like, oh, it's 35 to 7. And so it's like, oh, well, Very all right, true. cool. They've already taken Trevor out of the game or, you know, they uh-huh. took Deshaun out of the game. Now, the year we won our, well, our second natty, but our, our first natty in my lifetime, uh, mm-hmm. you know, I, I was in Buford and Clemson, I was working at, yes, that's Clemson. Um, um, I was working a Monday to Friday job, so I was off on Saturday, so I got to watch like every game, and that was that was great. Um, okay. was, so that was cool. So I'll I'll take that um, that I got to at least watch every game that season. Yeah, I've never been able. Um, well, it's been my, well, my professional career, like I started off work, working at a TV station, so like I've always been around TVs watching these games. Shoot, there was a period of time where I was this a master controller. Um, which basically they're in charge of like switching the chan- um, you know, the content and putting in commercials at a TV station. So I was actually, it was like my job to watch the game. So I never had that separation. So that's unfortunate. Um, all right, moving on. Uh, I got a kick out of the book club part. Um, that's kind of, uh, kind of hits a soft spot for me since this is our uh, last feature movie and we're in a movie club. So, uh, but both me and you are Chet, and Otis doesn't exist because we actually watched the movie, right? Yes, yes, we did actually watch the movie. Begrudgingly um, on your part, maybe. <laughs> I mean, I went into it excited, but um, this, this, it just didn't it just didn't hit for me. Whereas you, like, are like, yo, I loved the dialogue. Like, I thought the dialogue was bad. I thought they tried too hard to make it cool. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I thought these guys they all sounded the same. Like. He's like, I want to make cool dialogue. All right, I'm going to try. Everybody's going to have the same dialogue. I'm going to mention it in the movie that they have the same dialogue. <sighs> okay, <laughs> we get it. They all sound the same. They've all been around each other for four years. Uh-huh. They all sound the same. We got it. Cool. Why? Then, uh, oh, go ahead. I was saying, and then Homeboy went out and he's like, he took this 16-year-old girl on a date. 
And it was like she was quite smoky. Yeah, and then the next day was seventeen year her seventeenth birthday, and so he just like kept going out with her, and I'm like, wow, that would. Just, what was what was the quote like? Now you understand the references from Seventeen magazine or something cheesy like that. Yeah, he's like, yeah, no, tomorrow you'll get them better. I, I, just, I, I, I was very. I, I was just like, brother, what are you doing? This is where you're supposed to run. And you're like, okay, I'm gonna take you home now. And she's just like, now I'm only gonna go to first base with you. And then like the end of the oh, movie, yeah, that was the line. <laughs> and then like the end of the movie, he's like, oh, we're gonna go to prom. I already bought the tux, and I'm just like, oh. Fucking hell, man. Oh, wow. I, I, I forgot about that part. I just, I remember the part where, like, they go to, like, go get a pizza or something. And, like, you know, yeah, she's like, kind of like, isn't she kind of like a, ba- a badass townie kind of girl is kind of the gist of it? Oh, yeah. Yeah, before you found out that she was 17, like, she had, like, pulled a tire iron out because this guy wouldn't, like, let her parallel park and he had a bow hunter i'd rather be bow hunting and he's yeah. like <laughs> we don't mess with the guy who'd rather be bow hunting <laughs> yeah so, um yeah, i got a kick out of that for sure it's what just I, so, what yeah. i was about to say was why on earth did i never get a job at blockbuster i mean quentin tarantino worked at a, at a video store why why didn't i do that uh, I did work at Best Buy, so I did got to talk about TVs and stuff, which was pretty cool. But yeah, it was fun. I love um, movie rental places and movies because you kind of, kind of like they'll mention movies like that, like I guess they want to give like props to or something. Well, we get like a a Leprechaun two poster, which is kind of strange, but I think they mention like terms and terms of endearment. And the one that caught my my eye is um, they're being pretentious, but they're talking about the the unbearable likeness of Bean, which is a criterion that I kind of had my eyes on for a while. I think it's really long, but um, one of these days I'll watch it and I'll let you know. So, um, but yeah, <laughs> so Otis tries to get a job at the the video rental store, and he's like all dressed up in his suit and sport coat or whatever, and like this is like a second interview, which they kind of make a joke out of the fact that like you know this is a really mediocre job. Why would you need? Why does it have to have this prestige? and like the owner or the manager or whatever is this big d bag i was watching back through it and he has like these stains all over his shirt and they got like this craziest like categorization like all these like sub genre sections um wasn't there like one like just like about animals or something i forget yeah it's like where would you place this movie and he's like comedy he's like yeah you would think that but it's about dogs or something and it was like this buddy, is ridiculous. It's buddy like the dog most, movies. <laughs> yeah, it's like the most ridiculous thing I'd ever heard. Um, so, <laughs> and like he, the guy wants to be like a future filmmaker, and he's like just sitting up at like the cash register, and he's like, one day when I make my movie, I, I mean, I don't know where they're gonna put it in the genre section because it's just gonna be all the genres, and it'll be playing, you know. <laughs> it's like, okay, dude. Yeah, and it's like. We'll just watch it here at work. And he's like, well, if you make this film, you're still going to be here. And he's like, oh, yeah, probably not. Um, <laughs> so. So speaking of bow hunting, what you have any stickers on your your ride? No, I've never. I no? have put some okay. stickers on my cars previously, but I have none on this car. Um, OK, but they're usually all nerdy, of course, because, you know, that's how I live my life. Um, mm hmm. I one of my cars I had a I had a death proof no not death proof um Planet Terror um yeah death proof is pretty wicked to put on a car I'm not... <laughs> <laughs> yeah no Planet Terror um and I, I usually I've had Clemson stickers that's the most common one is some sort of Clemson paw okay um but yeah nothing nothing currently I went through a period where I went through a few vehicles um. And so I kind of toned it down on decorating the vehicles, especially because my in-laws are like really like, <sighs> anyway, I, I inherited the car I have. So I don't know. I just hadn't bothered decorating my car much. I did get an Eagle Scout um, sticker on it recently. So that's the one addition I finally, I had had this car for a year and I finally peeled off the sticker that said Carolina girl from whenever my wife drove it. So there you go. Oh, you don't um, want to be a Carolina girl? Not anymore. Not any sweet Carolina girl. So, yeah, I'm not here to sing. I'm here to talk about movies and moving on. <laughs> All right. Uh, definitely never been a situation in a situation where I'm trying to get with a girl and there happens to be a, cu- a couple already have done their thing in the next bed and asking for a condom, huh? Oh, boy. Um, 
No, no, I can't ever say that. Uh, can't ever say that I've been in that situation. Uh, Thankfully. But, but like they, uh, all right. So let's get into the final scene. Um, yeah, there's some good stuff at the end. Um, they finally break up the band. They figure out they gotta move on with their lives. Uh, he's finally like, oh, I'm gonna go to go to uh, Prague to go see my girl, and he doesn't have his passport. Like. I'm not sure if anybody would just be randomly carrying their passport. I mean, it was 1995, pre-9-11, so things were a little looser back then. But, yep, we get the line. You can I mean, always to be go fair, tomorrow. He, he had lost his wallet for part of the movie, too, but I guess this was like three months in the future. So mm-hmm. I guess he should have had it. But he did decide to do this just on a whim. Mm-hmm. So... Probably, uh, yeah, probably it's, it's better to prepare a trip like that. Actually, Frances Haw has a really good section where, like, she's hanging out with these people and they're talking about how wonderful Paris is and you should go to Paris. And so what she does is she flies to Paris on a whim and she's, like, uber, like, jet-lagged when she gets there. So, like, she just kind of sleeped half the time and she doesn't know anybody. And so she basically has this, like, miserable time in Paris. And... It kind of that's another Noah Baumbach movie, um, Francis Ha, and so I I kind of like kind of correlated that that idea of like this romanticized version of going to Europe. Um, some pretty good quotes. What is it? Because um, Grover is like thinking like, yeah, I've been to che- I've been to the uh, Czechoslovakia. I know like um, what it's like to realize that American coffee is trash, and oh, they're actually known for their beer. Grover is like, oh, that's yeah, what it's that's what I meant because. Yeah, this guy doesn't want to go nowhere. He just wants to hang out with his buds. So, um, but yeah, I, I really enjoyed the whole like travel aspect of this movie. Um, and I, and I, I, I will admit the fact that like whenever I was abroad, like I was, I remember seeing like, cause I was in a fraternity and like seeing all stuff about like our new pledge class coming in. And then they were like emailing me questions about who I was and stuff. So I was like, oh, I kind of miss my guys back in college, but so a little memory break for you there. Um, well, yeah, you really enjoyed the ending. What, what, tell me about that. Well, mostly enjoyed the ending. I had, I do have a small, small issue with part of the ending, but the, 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 the airport scene, he like finally is like, yes, I'm going to go get my girl mm-hmm. months and months too late. He finally decides to stop being a fucking pussy. Mm-hmm. And he's going to go get his girl. And, you know, he goes through this whole long, uh, you know, monologue, speech, whatever. It's got to be today. It's got to be today because if I don't do it, and he's, I, it's going to be this cool story. Can you find me a spot on the plane? Blah, blah, blah. The girl who's Susan from Friends is like, yes, I will – we found you a spot. I just need your passport. And then he's like, Oh shit, I don't have my passport. And she's like, well, you can always do it tomorrow, but you know, he's not going to do it tomorrow because he, he, he only did it because he was in the airport putting homeboy on the plane. So, you know, he's not going to do it, but it was just, it was that, that whole scene was, was really good. And then you hit that final flashback to where they're talking outside of the bar. And he's like, Hey, I really wish this was in the future where we're old. So that way, I, if I wanted to kiss you, I could just do it so it wouldn't be weird or whatever. But like there's social cues and the way she was reacting to what he's saying, it's like, brother, you can just kiss her. And so you, the end of this movie, you don't get him kissing her for the first time and you don't get him going back to the Czech Republic or to Prague to get her. And it's just a fucking huge bummer. And the whole movie was already a bummer. It was like, give me something. Give me something. Like, yeah, it ends with them being all flirty and you see the beginning of their relationship and she's mm-hmm. all happy and feeling him. But it's like, you, they could have fucking kissed right there and it would have just been a much better ending in my personal opinion. I'm sure you have some reason as to why that's a great ending or something. I 
Just um, I wouldn't say it's a great ending. I thought it was um, a sweet ending. I thought it was super sweet. Like he, like they're they're walking there, and like he breaks into this like conversation about like I wish we were an older couple so I could just lean in and kiss you right now, and that would just be like totally like enduring instead of like super awkward since like we've kind of just you know started getting to know each other, and so I thought that was an interesting line to be like. You know, a lot of guys just kind of want to be at that place with the girl where, you know, they, they can just kind of make a move and like them dig it instead of it being like having to do all like the groundwork to get to know them and charm them first. So, yeah, I could kind of dig what he was getting at there. And yeah, I mean, she has that smile and gosh, yeah, that, that kind of melts me. <laughs> just I mean, that. Her, her smile is killer. And like to my point is like, mm-hmm. yeah, he but he had done the groundwork because obviously she was feeling it. And like, that's, that's to sound cheesy, like the sign or whatever, or at least Mm -hmm. that's how I perceived it. There's, there's that moment when you generally can tell if, you know, the person that you're, you know, you're talking to, to use our terms from today and, you know, or that you're courting or whatever. And it seemed Mm -hmm. to me that she was into it and that would have been the time Maybe I'm wrong. It's just how I perceived it. And it's like, and this also is a freaking movie. So of course it's the time. And it's the end of the movie. It's like, <laughs> give me the fucking kiss. Give me something after this yeah. hour and a half movie. You don't put him on the plane. Give me, give me, give me their first kiss. Uh, G- give me something, Noah bomb back. And you didn't <laughs> see. You fucking I, jerk. All right. So yeah, I could definitely see where like you were kind of looking for pay, um, like, um like payoffs throughout this thing but like i thought this whole thing like just kind of digesting every little conversation every little hangout every little funny moment like i found all that satisfying so um you know to each his own can you think of movies like these intellectual banter movies um that i've described that like you did like kind of eat up every conversation every little quip um everything was satisfying to you I mean, you mentioned one. I don't know if it was on this one or the the, the tape that got destroyed, but uh, Clerks, yeah, um, Clerks Two, which I thought was better than Clerks, and I know for Kevin Smith fans that's blasphemy, but Clerks Two is a better <laughs> movie. Like, it's just a better movie. It may not be as iconic, but it's a better movie. Yeah. And there's my hot take for the evening. Um, <laughs> so definitely, definitely better made. <laughs> yes, it's, it's uh, he had money, he had a budget, he had yeah. actors, and not just guys from down the street um yeah, true so story. i mean i was listening to one of his podcasts and he was telling about like the first time that like they recreated the quick stop in like another state or whatever and it like totally blew his mind and he was like coming to tears like watching this this artificial quick quick, quick stop come to life so a little digression there but yeah we gotta yeah. watch a kevin smith movie one of these days because he gets a lot of hate but i think we both kind of dig him Maybe dogma or mall rats in our future. Oh yeah, something. Um, I'm sure that mall rats will be mentioned in the next segment. Uh, not mall rats, dogma. Yeah, uh, probably so. Especially if, yeah. you, if you looked at my notes at all. <laughs> I, I did a little bit, but I mean, uh, I was probably going to mention that anyway. Um, as long as it's not the reboot, we'll be good. Because uh, yeesh. Um. Um, I think I mentioned oh, that oh, on um, Jalen Silent Bob reboot. Okay. Yeah, I think I mentioned that on one of the previous episodes in one of my good, bad, and ugly segments. So, nice. all right, but yeah, I found this movie like super sweet, comfort food to me. Uh, four and a half stars. I mean, I, it didn't blow my mind, but I found it super relaxing and enjoyable. I mean, four and a half sounds like it came really close to blowing your mind, brother. Um, I gave it two and a half. Like. I think it's very, it's just a very average. I don't think it's terrible. I don't think it's necessarily great. The, the flashback scenes, um, with Grover and Jane definitely gave it some more rating to me. And, uh, that last scene with the, in the airport, but just the rest of it, it was just very bland and t- to me personally. All right. We finally reached it there, Joey. We're at our final challenge movie of the season. Um, which is one of my favorites, The Last Temptation of Christ. Um, A Criterion I rented the first time. I remember listening to the commentary uh, several years ago before I ever knew what Criterion was. It is spine number 70. Uh, A synopsis I found of the film is, 
um, and we all know the story. Uh, the carpenter, Jesus of Nazareth, uh, Nazareth uh, tormented by the temptations of demons, the guilt of making crosses for the Romans, pity for men and the world, and the constant call of God, sets out to find what God wills for him. But as his mission nears fulfillment, he must face the greatest temptation, the normal life of a good man, based not on the Gospels, but on the Nikios uh, Kazizakis uh, novel of the same name. Now, I was a little nervous picking this for our challenge movie, but we do have a little bit of history with these movies, because like we, I think we had teased in the previous episode that, um, yeah, we actually saw The Passion of the Christ together, and whenever I thought after the episode i think weren't those tickets given to us from like a friend of yours or something because that movie was like impossible to see when it first came out yeah they okay so how they were given they were given to us they were given to us by my girlfriend at the times roommate who was super religious like super super religious because like when this this movie first came out especially in rock hill south carolina where uh, we were going to school at winthrop university like we had just had this blizzard right and so, first of all, the roads are, like, all jacked up. And then, like, this movie comes out, and, like, every church in the area was, like, buying out every single show for The Passion of the Christ. We didn't go to college back in 1988. <laughs> this was yeah, uh, um, 2003 <laughs> for The Passion. <laughs> yeah, it came out in 04? It came out in February. Right. I think the came out at the end of February. So I think by then the roads and stuff were clear. The blizzard was in like January, if my memory serves. I I recall seeing snow on the ground still. So I remember kind of all, but I mean, that was freshman year of college. That stuff all kind of blurs together. But I mean, you um, could be right. I, I, I thought that the, the the blizzard was earlier, but hell it could have been in February. I just remember it was like, holy hell, there's 16 inches of snow in like one day. I had never seen more than like an inch of snow uh, living in Florence. So, yeah. yeah, same here. I'm from, from Charleston. So, um, but yeah, I distinctly remember when that, when The Passion of the Christ came out by Mel Gibson. Like, I was working at uh, Books and Books a Million at the time, and I would see like these Newsweek um, magazine covers that had like this comparison that showed like the, the Jesus from Passion and then like um, William Defoe from. Um, from the last temptation so there was kind of like this like you know the latest shocking jesus movie since the last temptation of christ and i was like huh i wonder what that's all about and so yeah i've seen this movie five or so times i just it's it's a great movie to me um i'll go quickly into like kind of some of my background like I was raised um, Lutheran, like when Good Friday comes around, I'm always looking for the chance to watch a good Jesus movie because just kind of feel like being in like the religious groove, I I really enjoy that. Now, the one part about me and religion that don't get along is the fact that I'm kind of a lazy butt in the morning. So getting actually getting to a church service uh, can be a little bit of a challenge, especially with the three kids now. Like you would, that, that, that sounds totally crazy, but the fact is like, my the kid that should be like in the nursery will refuse to go to a nursery and so like pretty much it's it's kind of miserable to go to church because like he has to be in the service and he's gonna be making all this fuss but i'm going on this big diatribe that doesn't need to be go there uh essentially like i really like religion i have my doubts i'm probably like a lot of people in saying that but um but religious movies in particular um, they kind of get me back in that groove and, um, I really appreciate that. It, it gets me thinking about kind of like life and stuff and like the meaning of life. So that's there. Um, did you want to go into a little bit about, um, cause I mean, obviously with a religious movie like this, you kind of have to like, where explain where you're coming from. Um, I mean, I definitely grew up going to church, um, but it was more of, you know, I was kind of forced to go. I Sure, same here. Um, and my memories of... What kind of church was it? Different ones, because I moved a bunch, but I definitely think they were all mostly Baptist or some sort of Southern, Southern Baptist. Okay, um, which can be a little I, rougher. What I took away, um, honestly, from church as a child... Um, and I took it into being a, a teenager and then into it as an adult. And then I had some stuff as a teenager also that influenced um, my decisions. Um, but what, what I took away was that was fear. 
was was straight fear. Um, Do this and you'll go to heaven or don't do that. If you do this, you'll go to hell. If you don't do this, you'll get into heaven. And it's Mm -hmm. it's fear. Um, You be be scared of God, be scared of Satan or you'll, you know, you kind of kind of that's the base premise of it. And I got older and yeah. um yeah, going to a Lutheran church, the 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 whole like bottom line theme at Lutheran churches is like um, you know, ask for forgiveness and you'll be given forgiveness into the kingdom of heaven. And um yeah, I would go to a lot of non-denominational churches and occasionally like Baptist churches with friends and yeah, it was all like fire and brimstone, which I was like, "Whoa, that's not my speed." So yeah, I can sympathize with you there. Well, Lutheran is uh, very similar to Catholic. Like it's the closest Protestant church to Catholic, right? True. Yeah, Martin Luther he rebelled from the Catholic Church, so the first Protestant group was Catholic or um, Lutherans. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So um, I found. Um, I mean, you you asked me before, like after you you know picked this movie, like you know you asked me in private. Um, you know, kind of what my beliefs are. And, you know, I, I said agnostic for a long time because, you know, there, there's got to be somebody or something. But you know, as I've gotten older and I've dealt with some different things that I'm not necessarily going to go on to in here, but just yeah. um, I definitely found myself leaning a lot more towards atheism. It's just, um, you know, you, you you look at the world and you like, hell, you look at, you know, what we've talked about the last couple of episodes, and, you know, as you look at, uh, you know, the, the, the Rona and all that shit that's going on now and, you know, Oh, and you know, you get all ready. Oh, we're going to pray. We're going to pray for it to go away. Well, it's like, well, if you know, we have a God, it's like, why you have this all encompassing, loving, all powerful God. Then why are we killing people? Why are we letting people act like assholes? Why are we letting people act like stupidity? And it's, Oh, well, you know, free will, yada, yada, yada. There's all these different answers and all these different things that everybody can say, Mm -hmm. or it's Satan and it's this, or it's that, or it's, it's the end of the world. It's fire and brimstone. It's punishment for this, or you know, people are straying away from God, and there's false idols that are sports people and or movie yeah. stars and this and that, and it's just there's so many things, and it's or you know, you can only live life a certain way or this, and it's just you know, it's it's whatever. You know, you want to believe something. I'm not gonna knock you or anybody else for yeah. believing what you want to believe. Just don't knock me for believing for what I want to believe, you know, you want to have a conversation. That's cool. We, let's have a yeah. conversation. Let's talk about it. Um, you know, I took, uh, my one year at Winthrop, I took a religion class. Um, I'm very interested in different okay. mythos and that, that kind of stuff. Um, yeah. So, and I try not to call like Christian Christianity mythology. I know that offends people, but you know, before the Romans was converted to Christianity, you know, it's Greek and Roman mythology, um, and they, they call sure. everything most people Christians I mean, call most other religions that aren't Christianity, Judaism, or um, Islam. Pa- they call them mythology, yeah, not paganism, just Christians, but so forth. yeah. So yeah, that's very well this, said. Um, because I, I mean, I, I find it as a, a branch of history because you, if you want to understand the history of people, religion makes them do things, and so absolutely, yeah, yeah. There's yeah, you said some interesting things there that kind of get on my, me too. Like you'll go on like social media and people will be like, oh, prayers, this, prayers, that. And I'll never say that. That's not me at all. Like I'll say like best wishes to you. Like I don't want to like throw like prayers at you because I'm not sitting at home all day praying by any means. Like sometimes I'll like think introspectively and I guess that's some kind of some of the ways that I pray when I do go to church. And scouting is very um the, the scout is reverent, so we do have um, some religious religious aspect, aspects of scouting that I take part in, and I enjoy and I respect. Um, the other part is, I remember when I was volunteering for a church, I was doing some sound audio stuff, and I would hear people say, "Well, I don't feel called to do this. I don't feel called to do that." It was like they were like making God their reason for anything they wanted to do. Which to me was like either you want to do it or you want to or you don't want to do it. You don't need to put God in the middle of like what you do or what you don't want to do. You don't. It's not God's fault that you don't want to do this. So that that that's that's a little pet peeve of mine. 
So, I mean, the way people talk about religion might be one of my annoyances about it. Um, and like I said, I'm very, um, I'm def. I mean, if you want to compare uh, a re religious belief to a rock, I'm definitely a little bit more of a piece of dough than a rock. Um, anyway, or moving on, maybe or um, as we were talking about, hey, maybe we're going to mention dogma. You know, maybe if you have ideas instead of beliefs, because an idea is easier to change than a belief. Sure. I believe that's a, a quote from that movie. Mm -hmm. Um. But yeah, I do I do enjoy a good religious movie. Um, like I have a whole letterbox list um, about. I think I called it like my Good Friday rotation. I have like the Passion of Christ on there. I've seen that at least four or five times. Jesus Christ Superstar. I've now seen twice. Um, kind of want to see Ben Hur again. That's kind of a sneaky Jesus movie. You don't really know that's a Jesus movie until kind of like the very end. So that's that's a big uh, sword and sandal epic there for you. But. Um, Okay, let's get into the long... Okay, so this is my favorite Martin Scorsese movie, and it's... Whoa, that's that's very surprising, but continue. Okay, so, and the reason, so, like, I and my second favorite is Goodfellas. Like, Goodfellas makes me, just kind of makes me sore with how much fun that movie is, but this one is, it makes me think so much deeper and makes me emotional, and with that, that's why this one touches me the most. Now, Marty, he actually, when he he grew up a good old Catholic boy, and he actually thought he was going to be a priest for a while. And so I remember I've been listening to a bunch of chat about um, this movie, and I actually wrote I read the essay in the Criterion booklet, and um, and so yeah, he wanted to be a priest growing up. His passion project was to make his Jesus movie. And so, like, along the way, when he started making movies, he was handed this book, The Last Temptation of Christ, and he was kind of on a mission to go make it. And I think he got the funding to make it in 1983, I believe it was, and then it just kind of fell apart. And then he, I think he made After Hours later, and then Universal gave him the option to do it again in 1988, and... Um, his, his Jesus changed up. He ended up with William Defoe, and it was a much, much lower budget movie. And like he like you I heard him on the commentary. And he's like, oh, man, I wish I could have had more like an up like because you'll notice the Roman soldiers in this movie are very like they actually use the same Roman soldiers a couple times. But they just kind of flash pan to make it look like several groups of Roman soldiers. So this was a very, very low budget movie. But he knew that's what he had to do. And so he finally get this. He finally got this movie released. They filmed it in Morocco, and it was like released to like instant criticism. Like for some reason, like the ultra religious right thought this movie was like, like this is the Jews. This is their Jewish movie. You know, messing with our Jesus. This is total blasphemy. This shows Jesus. You know, you know, wanting to have a family, dancing. I mean, that is that. That's not how you portray Jesus at all. Which. I don't buy into that stuff at all. Like this movie right up front says this is not based on the Gospels. This is a fictitious story based on, you know, a story or what. So and so, I mean, that's how I take it. And I mean, there's a lot of like historical stuff in here as well that you can connect to. And um, yeah, a any any thoughts on the backlash? And a lot of the people that were like saying that this movie like they weren't going to watch it. I mean, they hadn't even seen it. And so a lot of this stuff is just, and I mean, I think dog Kevin Smith's like gone on the record saying like dogma got like basically the same response, like these ultra conservative Christians, like, Oh, you say anything bad about religion. This is instant, like trash. And we're going to speak out against it. I mean, to think that a human man or a human male, female, whatever, doesn't want to have a family, doesn't want to live a normal life to want all the things that you want naturally is ludicrous and stupid so whether or not you know these other things are true but like in dogma you know they talk about how in the bible he goes from being a boy to being 30 or 33 or whatever and it's like they cut out you know they're like oh they cut out of the time he had as a child you know with his brothers and sisters and then they're like oh well mary and joseph you know mary was a virgin it's like well to be gullible enough to think that you know they didn't get down after, you know, they were married and they had this kid is this gullible, this gullibility. So, yeah, now to think that to, to be so entrenched in a book that was 
carried down by word of mouth for years and years and years, and then translated into different languages, different languages, different languages, and then lost, and then was only written in Latin by the people in power, and then translated again into different languages, and then pressed, and then people were like, you know, I want this version, and this version, and this version, to think that everything written in that book is 100% correct, is A, or, crazy. Oh, a lot yeah. of the a lot of those people say that's the word of God, and... um yeah, I, I I I definitely get what you're getting at there with it. Um, the Bible being, you know, pass a story passed down, and yeah. So, yeah, I mean, you're supposed to take the ideas like the Ten Commandments and the Golden Rule and all of that kind of stuff, mm-hmm. and apply those to your life, but not like every word of it is literal truth. And to think, like again, like I said, to think of human, parab- mostly parables and stuff, lessons. Yeah, yeah. No, hey, uh, you know. Like the other movie that I just watched with Willem Dafoe in it, um, y- you know, they are like, don't murder, don't rape, don't steal. These are these are things from any man of any faith can abide by. It's like, you know, that's, yeah, that's pretty much just don't do this kind of stuff and, you can go, yeah. and go with it. But yeah, it's it's crazy that people get so worked up over over movies and books today still in 2020. It's... Or then in this case in 1988, but, um, well, one thing I found interesting in the essay was, um, they kind of shaped the fact that the passion of the Christ being made was almost like a counterpoint to this movie. Like apparently the, the, the book, the passion of the Christ is, um, is based off of is from like an anti kind of an anti-Semite, um, um, an author, that they adapted it from. And I mean, you really do get that. That's an obvious slant in passion of the Christ is you watch it and you see that they're like the Jews were all responsible for the fact that, you know, they wanted Christ crucified and stuff like that. So it definitely has that slant. Um, there's some great aspects to that movie as well. Um, but we'll point those out along the way. Um, but to dive into the movie, I kind of want to set it up. I think this movie has a brilliant setup. It, it, it starts off with a very stunning quote. Um, hopefully I, che- I wasn't able to copy and paste it from Google, so I'll, I'll just read it from whatever I, I saw from the movie. Um, the dual substance of Christ, the yearning so human of man to attain God has always been a deep inscrutable mystery to me. My principal anguish and source of all my joys and sorrows from youth onward has been the inse- innocent, um, merciless battle between the spirit and the flesh. My soul is the arena where these two armies have clashed and met. And so you, you see that Kawasaka um, quote on screen, and then it goes into this like fabulous um, Middle Eastern kind of drumbeat music, and you see these very stunning red and black thorns. And oh, I mean, I'm ready from I'm ready for a Jesus movie at that point. All right, so uh, let's dive right in. Um, so we have this. So I've always been really invested in this movie. I think it's so fascinating that you have this unique character actor like William Dafoe who plays this Jesus, and it's not like this sure Jesus. Like I know exactly what I'm doing. This is a, a human, confused Jesus that is trying to understand this this idea of being both man and both God. And I just find that it's just so relatable, and um, like this idea. And and from the downbeat of this movie, I feel like. I'm along the journey. I'm I'm totally on board with whatever he's going to like go through and like from the beginning like he's like an absolute like scrutinizing pain because apparently like God is like communicating to him but he, it makes him feel like uh, what like an eagle sw- swooping down and like putting talons into him. I kind of got the the essence is what they were describing and he is so bitter about the fact that like God has like chosen him but does hasn't told him what to do yet that he's like rebelling against God and it shows that he um, uses carpentry skills to actually make crucifixes for the Romans and we see early on a crucifixion scene where he's helping the Romans and like he's despised because of that so this is a very all up front a very different Jesus that we're seeing and very interesting as well um, any thoughts on the the cast so I thought they did a really good job as making basically everybody Middle Eastern. I just thought it was very weird that you had everybody but like two people Middle Eastern, and those two people are very obviously Caucasian. 
um, okay. being Jesus and Judas. And obviously, especially in 1988, uh, the movie had already had a ton of backlash. But then, uh, if you were to depict depict Jesus as anything other than Caucasian, like I think the world would have erupted. Um, and I th- and, oh, go ahead. I'll, I'll, I'll make th- my point. And I think that you know this is uh, I think Willem Dafoe as an actor, like he did a he did an amazing job. Um, and I think Harvey Keitel did an amazing job. I think that the acting was was great throughout by everybody. Um, but it was just I just thought it was it was just really funny. You see, like everybody is Middle Eastern, and then there's these two white guys, um, and it just sort of stood out. And it was just a thing that I noticed. I guess it doesn't really stick out to me. I'm not sure why. Um, now, if you watch Passion, Passion of the Christ, that that whole movie is in like Hebrew, like Aramaic and Greek or whatever, which is the language of the time. I was listening to the commentary with the the writer of the film was a uh, Paul Schrader, frequent Marty collaborator, and what they were trying to do is to try to make it as colloquial as possible, kind of like what we were talking about with the Bible, where like the story gets passed down and is written in different languages over the time so um by they try like whenever they were talking about like when they were going through the script like if there were like these these or thou's or stuff i mean obviously we don't say that stuff now so they were trying to make it more in common speech um this is not necessarily what you're talking about with the, the fact that you had these you know harvey Keitel and william defoe as you know white guys with mostly um uh, Middle Eastern folks. Um, a lot of more. Uh, they did actually talk about that in the commentary. The fact that, like, facts that there's a lot of um, Islamic folks in the in the cast, and they would have to pause to pray like throughout the day. I mean, those were definitely the kind of people they were working with there. But um, to me, I mean, I think the only time it stood out was there's this 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 nice moment where um, Defoe is sitting on like this cliffside with this other guy and you can clearly see like Defoe's like blue eyes compared to the other guy and he's much um, darker looking so it stood out to me there um, yeah um, and then another thing about Paul Schrader um, and he also wrote like Taxi Driver are you pretty familiar with Paul Schrader uh, I mean I've seen Taxi Driver um, okay. I saw it in my like about two years ago in 2018 Okay. He's a pretty interesting guy. He actually started off as a uh, movie critic and he moved into writing movies and he's also directed a bunch too. So yeah, hopefully you'll see. Um, I mean, I, I'm surely you've seen some of the fo- um, movies he's written, but um, directed as well coming up. All right. And uh, one of the, one of the things he said, he said a few things in the commentary that really struck me. And the first one was the fact that this, this whole, this throughout this movie is this big metaphor all about like the human condition. And, um, and so we've tapped into that a little bit, but, um, we'll keep going. Um, yeah. Do you think you would have preferred, I mean, do you remember the passion being in all like, uh, Hebrew, Aramaic, like foreign languages? I mean, I do remember it. It's, it's like, I've, you said you've seen it multiple times. I've only seen it that one time in college. Okay. Yeah. So that's a long time ago. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, I do remember that it was, uh, that it was foreign language. I just really remember it being very brutal. Um, oh yeah. Which a lot of so people have like compared it like to the the fact that that was the torture porn era. Yeah, it was definitely like uh, I remember it being oh it's a torture porn movie why would you do this, you know, Mel Gibson's a is an anti semite which I guess kind of ended up being true but um <laughs> so all right now I kind of want to go into um so we've gone over like you know how this movie was made the backlash the main theme this is all about. Jesus really grasping like he wants to be a man, but he's also divine. And a really cool aspect that about this movie is the fact that Jesus, like he doesn't know what's going on up front. He gets bits and pieces along the way. And just like uh, kicking and screaming, like everything he says, I find just fascinating and I'm on board with so that I kind of have that feeling. Um, So like I had said, this movie was shot in Morocco. I think the landscapes are gorgeous. Um, it's described as a minimalist film. I don't really see that. Um, I think it's, I think it's very period and um, very full of, you know, everything it's depicting. Uh, did you catch any hints? Um, for example, like there's this real, I mean, going back to the whole Morocco and the landscape. I mean, there's some gorgeous shots of like cliff sides there that I really dug and like, um, 
yeah, any any thoughts on the, the look of the film or if it you the you felt that was low budget? I mean, I wouldn't have thought it was low budget. Because, I mean, it's a Scorsese film, so it's not something I think of as you know him having a low budget film, especially by 1988. Um, I mean, there was a lot of great nature shots and you know that kind of stuff. But I mean, where's your big budget in a in a movie that's you know there's you don't really have tech or anything that you have to worry about. Um, I mean, I guess, like you said, when they used a lot of the same Roman soldiers or anything, but I didn't really notice that. You don't have crazy costumes for the most part. Um, hell, that Mary Magdalene simplistic. spent half the Mary Magdalene spent half the movie naked, <laughs> um, which I was not expecting. Not complaining, just wasn't expecting. Yeah. Um, so. Um, so yeah, I wouldn't have. I mean, I guess technically, I guess it kind of is minimalist, but like, I, I, I guess when I don't think it's everything. I, I definitely don't think it's presented that way, especially with how the score and like the bombastic like language dialogue that's used throughout. It, it never, there's never a quiet for me. There's never a quiet moment. I never, I never thought it dragged at all. Um, uh, one interesting, a uh, huge difference between this and most Jesus stories is how they depict Judas, uh, Harvey Keitel's character. Um, most of the time, he's like depicted as like the most like vile person ever. I mean, he betrayed Jesus, but this movie does a great job at showing like, I mean, right from the upfront, he's like, Jesus, if you stray from the past one moment, uh, one inch, like I'm going to go after you. Like he is all about like getting this done. And so he's a very enduring character. They have a great relationship showing like the progression of like their plan, um, what's going on between the two guys. And it really makes you wonder like um, if the crucifixion of Jesus is, was uh, Jesus was God's plan. This movie has a great point about was Judas really that bad of a guy for falling with what God's plan was. Maybe it wasn't as like, you know, discussed between the two of them. Maybe it was more of human nature. I mean, I guess you could see that as him being evil and just, and just kind of God, like knowing what direction he would go. I guess you could kind of have that argument for why he's an evil person. But here I like this argument a lot better of how, you know, he knew what had to happen in order for his uh, Christ's um, plan uh, to, uh, to go come through, which is to um, betray him. So very interesting character. Yeah. And then the whole, you know, that whole thing of, you know, the, the last supper is generally perceived as somebody here will betray me. Judas, I know it was you kind of deal Mm -hmm. instead of in in this one. It's true. They all deny him. Yeah. Go betray me. Well, yeah, that's after, you know, afterwards they all betray him and one of them right. gets hung up, crucified upside down because he's not as good as him and blah, blah, blah. But, yep. you know, yep. this one is Judas, I need you to betray me. And it's, it's a very interesting take. They did they did some things that were that were that were very interesting. Um, that my real honestly, my real big complaint with this movie was that okay. it should have just moved at a at faster pace. I wish it was like 40 minutes shorter sure yeah um and a lot of times with 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 an epic like this like that length does make it feel like you've really gone on this long journey and i mean that's that's my only argument to that um let's get into a few of um do you have any favorite scenes you want to mention before i go forward um some miracles or confrontations with snakes I mean, there, there wasn't anything that like really, there, there was one that I, I thought, I definitely thought was funny. and made me kind of, kind of go, wow. And it's the scene where they're going to meet John the Baptist and yeah. everybody's naked in the water <laughs> and it's very striking. There's, yes. And then the, the thing that got me, and I guess, cause it was 1988 and this wouldn't happen now. There's, there's these dudes that are naked and they've got their wings blurred out and, and maybe it's because we were watching it on Amazon. Maybe I guess the criterion and I assume it is, but cause it was in the eighties. I, I didn't like, notice that at all. 
I mean, I couldn't help because it's just panning across and then just right in the middle of the screen, there's just blurs. And I'm oh, like, okay. this draws more attention to it than if it wasn't. And oh. it was just very jarring. I think that might be um, unique to Amazon. Interesting. Maybe. I mean, maybe, it, maybe it was. Did it, did it show the Amazon thing or the Criterion thing at the beginning of the movie? No. Okay. Maybe this is a different cut. Interesting. Um, the first one that stands out to me, I love whenever the, the music cranks up. And it shows that uh, Jesus has a following, and you you keep getting this shot of them walking further and further, <laughs> but they're amassing a much much larger larger crowd. That was definitely one that stood out to me as being a real like, oh yeah moment. Um, the next one in the desert. Um, so he goes out to the desert in order to be confronted by Satan, and so he goes through all these temptations, and um, so he's confronted by like a cobra and a, a lion and stuff and he knows that it's satan right away and he casts them off and um so those are all really cool moments um hmm, it's interesting to think about christ's message about the meek uh rising up to inherit the earth um whenever you were talking about religion like today how we perceive it so this is so there's a big sermon about this about how the meek will rise up and inherit the earth and it's kind of it rings some bells in my mind. The fact that it's a much different landscape. The world is um, where it's not just like the elites of the Roman empire and then the peasants that have to be oppressed by them. I mean, it's a diff much different world today. So it's interesting that we still have the same Christ message now as we do back then. But um, yeah, it's kind of food for thought, but um, yeah, Great moment whenever, uh, was it Mary Magdalene comes into town and they're all throwing stones at her and she's, he's like, no, no. I mean, who has not sinned before? Um, you know, we need to love each other. And that kind of goes back into the fact that like throughout the movie, um, he is a much different Jesus throughout because at first like he's confused, but then he like, he starts preaching this method and this message of love. And he does like, they have the sermon on the Mount scene and they show how like he used metaphor in order to describe how like love was the, like the seed that was that to, to spread across the people. And then people like misperceive that and end up like going and running out and wanting to go like murder Romans or something. Um, an interesting part about the John the Baptist scene I was listening to in the commentary is like, you remember the, like the naked women that are like swinging their hair. Yeah. Um, Marty had actually described that those people, he put those, th those women in there in order to be people that are misperceiving the message and taking it their own way and going into kind of a sexual ecstasy about it. So that's something I would have never picked up on that. It was neat to hear that the filmmaker was kind of explain that why that was there. Yeah. I wouldn't have picked up that on either. I just figured that they took that's their clothes did. off to get, mm -hmm. to get baptized and were dancing or something like I never would have. And there's some badass kind of crazy moments. There's the part where like one of his miracles is to like pull out his heart and like he's all like on this like we're going to baptize the world by fire kind of thing. It's more of like the um, very a very much more aggressive Christ in that part of the movie. And um, pretty cool moment whenever they go into the marketplace. They see that like they're doing all this money training on the Sabbath. And, you know, he he rises in uproar about that. Um, yeah, some some cool miracles we see throughout uh darn poor lazarus can't get a break huh oh yeah that was <laughs> let me see your hand oh i'm gonna stab you it's like yeah harry dean well, gotta... staten <laughs> he kind of he has kind of a character shift in this yeah i mean they got to get rid of they got to get rid of his uh his miracles they got to undo mm -hmm. undo everything yeah a lot of uh animals getting all cut up in this pretty authentic to the bible i suppose yeah, you got to have the animal sacrifice. And um, yeah, they depicted that pretty well. I think they showed like a whole like drain devoted by an animal blood or whatever. I'm not sure. I'm sure there's a lot of stuff in scripture about all that. Um, there's a few moments where, are you familiar with the term stigmata? Yeah, I'm familiar with the stigmata through the wrist, through the ankles. Although a lot of movies depict it through the hands, but it's 
Well, is isn't the term stigmata? It refers to like spontaneous bleeding and like um, spiritual reference to the crucifix- crucifixion. That's kind of what I've always understood. I mean, maybe, but usually, like, I mean, there's also a movie called Stigmata, but right. um, I think usually when they're when they're talking about the stigmata, usually the bleeding is most people or a lot of people reference it, and it's through the hands because right. that's of the crucifixion, but it's. The wrist. It's supposed to be the wrist, I believe, um, okay. as opposed to the. Well, there's a little bit of hands. that, and it's it's probably more or less foreshadowing, you know, what's coming up. Um, another one of my favorite moments. I mean, the score really swells in that whole Palm Sunday scene, um, you know, where he's riding on the donkey going into, I guess it's Jerusalem. <laughs> Excuse me, but yeah, that. Um, I I mean, any thoughts on the score? I mean, did that get you pumped at all? I mean, the music and stuff was fine. It's just that, like, by the time we got to, to it just everything felt like it took forever. And sometimes mm. in some movies and epic movies that that really works for me. This it just everything was just taking forever and ever mm. and ever and ever and ever and ever <laughs> and ever and um <laughs> like just it, it I I don't know it just I. There were scenes that probably could have been taken out, I feel. And like the beginning, like hearing you explain it where it was like he knew that he, you know, God was wanting him to do something, but he was he was rebelling by making the the, the crucifixes for the Romans. It was like, I didn't take that. It was, he was confused. He didn't know what in the fuck was going on. So mm-hmm. he was just like, I guess I'll make some crosses while my head hurts and, you know, until I figure out what's going on. Oh, now I'm the son of God. Okay. Well, I guess I'll be a Messiah kind of thing. And it's like, mm-hmm. we could have cut some time here. Sure. Uh, did I, did I have to sit in the whorehouse and watch 20 guys? Fuck Mary Magdalene. I could have just showed up at the end and we pretty cut, you know, a couple minutes here, you know, there's hmm. just different things hmm. um, here and there. Maybe I don't, I don't know. It's just the I mean, the music, like there were things like technically acting music, cinematography all of that was fine it just it just didn't do anything for me and not because it was a religious movie because mm-hmm. like, did you find it preachy i mean like what, it, what i mean you just kind of did you tune out like during some of the dialogue or or no i mean and because like i like willem dafoe and i like mm-hmm. it i mean i it, tuning out because it's preachy like I mean, I know what the movie is going to be about. I mean, I know it's going to be yeah. about Jesus Christ and obviously the last temptation, whatever that was going to be. I just felt that if the movie is supposed to be about the last temptation and that last 40 minutes is the big important part and we're great getting to the crucifixion and then that mm-hmm. we don't need two hours to get to that. And I felt that it took a long time to get to that. Interesting. Personally. Another Another one of the striking things I found that Paul Schrader said was he referred to Christianity as a blood cult, which makes a lot of sense. Um, I mean, you have the whole like essence of communion, like this is the blood of Christ. So that was a, a comment that is all, all. It sounds very striking, but I mean, there's still a lot to that. Um, oh, well, what, even if you go further back, like out outside of, you know, in um Catholicism where you would, you know, you, you drink the blood of Christ, the yeah. wine, that's the blood of Christ and the, the wafers that are the body of Christ. But if you go right. back to, um, to the old Testament where, you know, how many times was it you, you sacrificed the fattest lamb or, you know, Abraham had to sacrifice, was going to have to sacrifice his oldest son. Yep. That comes up in this movie. Yeah. You know, all those different things where they're sacrificing animals for the, for their blood. So, you know, that makes a lot of sense. Um, as well, going even further back than just, um, the new Testament and and Jesus. And so then we, um, moving forward, let's get into like the, the big, the big show. Um, so in this movie we have, so he gets arrested and he goes and sees David Bowie and they're basically in a stable and he's just like, no, I'm not going to do any miracles for you. I'm not like a show pony. Um, so this is a very downplayed minimalist version of Christ and Pilate getting together. Whereas in Passion of the Christ, I remember it's much more bombastic. And then at point, there's this big old trial where like the high priests are like, crucify him. You know, you can't let him off the hook kind of deal. And so there's a big difference in the passion and temptation right there. And 
damn crucifixion's a nasty way to go um they were talking about on the commentary where like defoe could only really because i mean defoe was really hanging on a cross like naked all like that and like he could only stand it for like a couple minutes at a time he was saying like if people were up there longer i mean they just must have like totally gone insane from how painful that must be i mean on top of the fact that i mean they're nailed up there i mean can you imagine a nastier way to like <laughs> be there plus i mean they're mocking him with this like crown of thorns which is such an iconic um shot in the movie in history um some pretty gruesome stuff there i mean no it's it's, it's got to be one of the most torturous ways t to go because i mean you you end up it's painful if my memory serves you end up suffocating from the way that you're um stretched out you for up, air yeah yeah so and then then yes and then you have these three gaping wounds from nails um and then you know like they said uh you end up um you know, like crows pick your eyes out and different things. It's just a, it was a, it was a gruesome way to die. And the, you know, the Romans were very, very brutal when it came to like, you know, making a show out of people and you know, they could have just beheaded them or, you know, it, you know, shot them with arrows or something, but nah, it was, it was a spectacle. Okay. So this finally gets us to our, our last temptation. Spoiler alert. Um, Okay, so to this point, this seems like a very normal Jesus movie. Um, I mean, it's very humanist Jesus. I definitely didn't notice that as much the first time I watched it. But what was what's about to happen, I definitely didn't see coming. Like, whenever, like, to me at this point in the movie, like, I totally forgot the movie was called Last Temptation of Christ. And so all of a sudden, like, he's gone through all of this. And then this little girl says, all right, your suffering is over. You can live a normal life now. I mean, you've done your part. And he's just like, all right, let's, let's go do that. And, um, yeah, it's like, whoa, oh. I've never seen this before. Um, well, the little girl also says that she's the guardian angel and that mm -hmm. his father doesn't want your blood and that you, you can go right. and do this. And then takes him and they're walking and he's like, what's this? And she's like, it's a marriage pr procession. It's your marriage to marry. Mm -hmm. And so it's, you know, everything he's wanted. No, nope. just to be married to Mary. So, of yeah. course, he's yeah. It's it's crazy because I think that goes back into like the, the scene where I think before they show how like he had to refuse Mary and then he asked for forgiveness later. Whenever you know he's in the brothel, you know, watching her getting you know um you know a day's work essentially. Um, well, he refused her right after that. Cause he goes to talk to her and then, mm -hmm. you know, she's still laying there naked and she takes her, ha his hand and like puts it down there. And he's like, no, thank you. Maybe not quite that, that, that nicely or calmly, but yeah. I think I definitely connected to the scene the first time I saw, cause at this point I was still, um, I don't think I'd been married yet. Um, but I really had that, that dream of being married and having kids one day. So I definitely related with like this desire, um, for, for what, what comes, which is he gets married to Mary. Um, now what's interesting is like, I've seen this movie five times, but really this whole last temptation part kind of felt kind of fresh to me all over again. I didn't really remember how it played out. Cause I mean, you remember so firmly, like. Like what happens during the crucifixion, what happens, you know, during the preaching and stuff. But for some reason, this didn't like verbatim stay in my mind. So I was kind of watching this fresh again, which was a really cool experience. Um, I found it well, very striking. All, mm -hmm. all those years of going to church and having the story of Christ, you know, told to you over and over and over. I mean, I haven't been in a church in. Well, I, I went to church some with with one of my last girlfriends, but like actively going to church for my, you know, as, since I was a child and look how much stuff I remember and, and still know mm -hmm. from, you know, going as a yeah. child. Sure. So, so I didn't remember at all the fact that I guess Magdalene, like after she has his baby, like she sees this white flash and like God strikes her down and she dies. Uh, and like, she you was get this still, eagle. I thought mm -hmm. she was still pregnant when she died. Oh, is that what happened? I, um, I just remember seeing her pregnant and then all of a sudden there's the flash and she's dead and they're mourning. So, uh, yeah, maybe so. Um, so yeah, that's, that's very striking. I mean, you wouldn't expect that. Um, 
and then she goes and hooks up with um what Lazarus is a uh, sister or also Mary. Yeah, also another well, Mary. And the and important the important part there is that the guardian he has the conversation with the guardian angel who tells him that he can't be he can't be mad because he was so happy when God saved him that he can't be mad that Mary dying was part of God's plan. Mm -hmm. And then she tells him that uh all women are the same or something that yeah, that I nature. do I do recall that line. That was an interesting one. Yeah, all women are one one mother or all the same. Yeah. And to go see Mary, the sister of Lazarus. And so he goes and sees her. Yeah. And so he ends up getting with her and having a child with her. Yeah. A whole, and a then whole she repeats the children. line to, I mm -hmm. guess, because her, Mary, Lazarus's sister, Mary, mm -hmm. her sister comes on to him or something. And so he ends up basically with two wives. Perhaps, yeah. It's... Or they're in some sort of thruple. One thing I did find striking here is he gets kind of, kind of late. I mean, he's definitely not like back in the wood shop, like working on like making chairs or whatever for the fam. He's just kind of like laying there. <laughs> he's very kind of slothy at this point. Um, but the next striking scene is whenever he does get confronted by Harry Dean Stanton. And, here, and he's like preaching and he's talking about like the story of Christ and how he died for our sins. And that kind of confused me at first because I'm thinking, you know, he got off the cross or whatever. That never really happened. But it's the fact that and he goes into this this story about how I don't care what what you did or not. This is the story. This is what people need to believe in. And so that's all that matters. It doesn't matter what really happened. And that's I mean. It kind of almost like steps out of the story for a minute to tell this little point, which is, is very poignant. I mean, it also, I think it also speaks to whether non-religious people always argue and, and t tell Christians, well, hey, you don't know if that really happened. Yes, Jesus, there's records that Jesus was an actual person. Moses was a real person, whatever. But how can you prove that? He really rose from the grave, you know, his Lazarus thing, you know, you can't actually prove any of this stuff, blah, blah, blah. And I think that that goes to, to prove that it doesn't matter. That's the story that the, the religious people in this particular story being the Jesus story, that's so what they believe. That's what, the, mm -hmm. yeah, it's what they need. Yep. So whether it's true or not, this is what they, this is what they need. So we're going to tell it and that's what's what that's what it's going to be kind of deal all right so as the movie fun, um heads into the climax uh we see all the apostle apostles confront him not sure where they were the whole time but anyways so he's an old guy you know he's still pretty slothy <laughs> he's not doing much i mean he did his part he he uh got up there on the cross came down and had a family but um anyways so like Peter and stuff, they all confront him and say, you know, you know, why rabbi did you not, um, you know, fulfill like your destiny or whatever. And then Judas comes and says the same thing. And then they figure out the fact that, you know, this was the last temptation, like this little girl, this guardian angel is actually Satan. And they flash back to the flame back in the desert. And yeah, um, I didn't expect that at all. The first time watching it, m mind totally blown. I mean, I found this to be a very emotional kind of um, journey, epic. That's how I experienced it. And then, yeah, he um, he goes up on this hill. I think you see, like, it's supposed to be, like, Jerusalem burning behind him, um, almost like the end times or something. And he's, like, pleading, like, please, I'm so sorry that, you know, I took the easy way. I mean, take me back. I mean, I want to fulfill this mission. Um, and then all of a sudden... He's backed up there on the cross. This was a whole, this temptation was a whole vision. And, um, I mean, right before the vision, he's like, why did you forsake me, Lord? And, you know, you, we go into the temptation and now he's back up on the cross and he says, it is accomplished. And then is, and then the film, like I thought it burned, but it's almost like the film like transcends because it turns like all these different colors and like. The music gets kind of eerie and then we start hearing these like church bells, which is kind of like this Easter, like, you know, we should be joyous that, you know, Christ fulfilled his mission. And then the, the film's over. And uh, by this point, I felt like so drained and like, wow, what what an experience that was.
I just wish that. <laughs> I mean, the end was really like, I was mad at myself that I didn't pick up that she was the devil, especially with Mary dying and then telling her to go be with another woman and then another woman and like, like it was so obvious to me. Once it's like it's blatant that it's the devil because obviously it's the last temptation. Yeah. But you forget, I mean, you forget at that point because you've been drawn into this long biblical epic that all of a sudden it starts going a different way. And you're just like on the edge of your seat saying, what the heck is going on? But I mean, at the same time, I like audibly said, well, here comes the last temptation. The okay. last temptation. Like, like, so I'm mad at myself that I didn't go, well, this is obviously Satan. Um, so... Yeah, I was I was mad at that scene uh, at, at myself. The, the the and then obviously you know, I've been complaining the whole time about how long it was, but at two hours and forty six minutes, you're like, where's you know, what's another five minutes or ten minutes for? At, at this point, we've spent so much other time in this movie doing stuff other than the Last Temptation and okay. all of this. So where's where's Easter? Where's him rising? Where's, where's his, you know, rising from the grave, you know, the, the last big huh. miracle, all of that. Like, because, you know, you spent, when they did the, the Lazarus miracle, talking about three days, they, they, like, they, I, I felt like they spent a lot of time foreshadowing that event specifically. Huh. And then they didn't do that. Now, like, I don't know. I mean, the, it, it, like, it doesn't make sense when the whole idea is the last temptation of the Christ, but with everything else that they went into before getting into the last temptation, when that's supposed to be the whole big thing of the movie, it felt like you could have spent another five minutes and done that. But that's just me. Yeah. And, I mean, to, to me, is, yeah, go ahead. I said the ending itself, you know, was, was a fairly fine ending. Like there, there was nothing wrong with it. It's just, like I, I felt like that that could have been there, but it didn't necessarily have to be there. I just I felt like it had been foreshadowed and then then wasn't. That that's all I was trying to say. Hmm. I to me it's so poignant, like him screaming, "It is accomplished!" And then you see the film transcend. I mean, it's I I don't see how they got gone could have gone up from there. I mean, in the Passion of the Christ, you do see him. I think resurrected, like standing over like. Um, like where the boulder rolls or whatever. I think you do get that in Passion of the Christ. But here, I mean, eh, it's an interesting take that, I mean, you would you wanted to see more. So there you go. All right, yeah. Uh, I, I mean, I already said it was one of my favorite Martin Scorsese movies. Uh, my second favorite, Goodfellas, is five stars. Yeah, this is five stars for me. I mean, this just gets me at my core and gets me thinking about, um, you know, the story that I've been brought up on and seeing it twisted and going on this emotional journey with this, such an iconic figure and Scorsese putting us in the chair to experience that. Um, it's a priceless for me, five stars. Um. Oddly enough, my second favorite Scorsese is also Goodfellas. This one is not my first favorite. Um, uh-huh. It would be three stars. I think uh, the acting, uh, the direction, it, it's there's a lot of stuff that is really good. I just, I, I think they could have got to some places a little bit faster. Um, and I think maybe some of the dialogue, I don't have any problem that it was all in English. I just think that maybe some of the choices of some of the stuff could have been changed a little bit. But I mean, I don't think by any means that it is a, a terrible movie or a bad movie. Um, it's just not what I'm going to be like champing at the bit to watch again or anything. Is your favorite, what is it departed or yes. Okay. My least favorite is um, what's it called? I'm totally blanking now. Um, I have to look it up. It's on Criterion too, and I watched it, and I was like, "What is this? This looks like a student film." It's his uh, period drama with Daniel Day Lewis. Um, of the ones I've seen, I think it's oh yeah, Age of Innocence. That movie is trash. <laughs> it, it honestly, it might be of the ones I've seen. Shutter Island. You didn't like Shutter Island? 
No, I, I everyone was like, this movie is so great, and I, huh. I and mean, it's been a long time. It's probably been ten years since I've seen it. Um, so I probably need to rewatch it. Um, <laughs> I also like I enjoyed Wolf, but like they could have cut Wolf thirty minutes Street. of de- he could have cut thirty minutes of decadence out of that movie, and I still would have realized just how decadent that dude was, and it would have been fine. <laughs> there you go. What's a really long movie that you thought deserved to be a really long movie? Because that seems to be one of your hang-ups, huh? I mean, <laughs> The Departed's long and good. Goodfellas is long and good. The Godfathers are long and good. Lord of the Rings are long and good. Okay. Um, so, I mean, there are movies that are long and good. It's just that, like, when you take something specifically, let's say we'll go with Wolf of Wall Street here, it was like almost three hours long and a lot of it was spent showing me or showing us the audience just how overly decadent this dude was. And you could have cut 30 minutes of that out. And I still would have gotten the same, the same story Hmm. in my opinion. All right. So so season one, it's, it's almost in the books here. So uh, let's go through a little bit of a recap of where we've been, where we've gone, where we're going. All right, so um, first off, thanks for everyone that's listened so far. Uh, We really appreciate I mean, there's been a few comments like, keep up the good work. So we really appreciate that. Um, But I wanted to get into what some of our um, popular uh, YouTube videos have been so far. So uh, by far, our most popular one has been, um, we need to talk about Kevin. I think that's in the 800s or something. Yeah, that sounds right. It's it was it was it was a kind of blew my mind the first time I looked and saw that it was that high, um, yeah. It's like like it's really connecting with the YouTube ag- algorithm and yeah, really glad to see that. Uh, it was really surprising to see that our debut episode Ashes and Diamonds has really stormed up um, at seven hundred and four. Maybe people are like checking out the podcast and are like, oh, well, let's start from the beginning at Ashes and Diamonds. Um, it's, it's I wouldn't also necessarily- that. Mm-hmm. That one's also one of our shorter ones, and I think on YouTube that might have a lot to do with it. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I guess I guess so. And then I was surprised that You Got Game is, our, I think, our third um, most popular at 396. So, yeah, all early episodes there. So um, Also, before we split into multiple um, ways to listen as well. Oh, true. Yeah, true sure enough. All right, so I have a few uh, superlatives here for you. Uh, I'm not sure if you have anything funny to say about me, but um, so I feel like people uh, may. Okay, so yeah, we've talked about uh, you know episode one. <clears throat> okay, so things I learned about Joey this season. So I found out that you are definitely not a Colin Farrell fan, which dragged down your appreciation for my first challenge movie that I thought you were going to be excited about with In Bruges. <laughs> Um, one of the times I noticed you getting really, really heated <laughs> was when you were talking about JJ Abrams and his, uh, treatment of the star Wars, um, saga. So you were not such a fan there. And I guess the biggest one of all is like how unpredictable you are in terms of like movies. Like at first, like at face value, like you seem like, you know, any like badass gangsta movie, you know, Joey's going to be down with, but then I threw La Lahane at you and you're like, nah, not for me. Really? I was like, really? And then, like, all of a sudden you throw up on Letterbox that Phantom, Phantom Carriage, that snore fest was five stars. I was like, oh, okay. So I never know what I'm going to get out of Joey, which, which definitely keeps me on my feet, keeping me refreshing on the Letterbox thing to see what you're going to think of each little thing. I think the mo- my, my, definitely my, my down moment of this season was when I refreshed and I saw Dogville with vomit all over your review. I was like, oh, this is going to be a time. Talking about this um, movie. So I wish you would have told me that you were going to do this so I could have, you know, done this not on the fly. Okay. But, um, so let's see. Things about Justin. Um, I know we, we, have, we had briefly talked about this earlier in the season. I guess maybe, I guess it slipped your mind. Yeah, yeah, I guess it did. So, um, so we... <laughs> And this is mainly, mostly a joke, but you know the butterfly meme? I'm not, no. Should I Google, uh, should I Google this? Uh, is this whatever? So, is uh, is this a, criteri- a Criterion movie? Is this a masterpiece? Oh, okay, that's, yeah. yeah. That's Justin. 
Um, it's a Criterion collection. It must be a masterpiece. Oh, no, not necessarily. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I said it's mostly a joke. Okay. Um, um, but, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I am you, searching for those. You, you do tend to love the Criterion collection, um, which for good reason. And I found a lot of movies I would not have found otherwise uh, via you and Carl, uh, thanks to uh, the Criterion collection. Um, you tend to... You tend to really like long really long epics or just long movies in general Mm -hmm. um and we'll sit through movies i normally would just would not watch otherwise um in general and it's not a bad thing um but some especially some of the movies you've challenged me to um I, I a would neither never even have heard of or B if I wasn't watching them for this, I might not have finished. Um, hmm. No, nah, maybe not the second part, but I probably wouldn't have started, I guess. But once, usually once I start them, I will finish them. Hence. Yeah, me too. Manos and well, sh- well shoot two. like me like if I even if I'm hating a movie like I know I'm gonna have a time like reviewing it so I gotta like get my ammunition so yeah I'm never gonna stop a movie once I've started yeah so okay sorry to blindside you I thought you might have had this cooking up no I, I I feel like once you said that like I feel like we did talk about it but I had completely forgotten about it so it's it's all good brother it's no... right. well if anything comes to mind feel free to roast me i mean i deserve it like at, at, at some points i've been like maybe we should say we're the average joe's movie club cast there's justin with the, the weird picks and jo- joey with the normal picks or something <laughs> well i mean you you definitely do more like the art or an out, art housey style stuff and uh i feel like i do maybe more of the mainstream style stuff so like even uh, you know, like on our Facebook page, like the description says you're more into art house and I'm more into like action revenge. But I like I say normal stuff, but like I'm talking uh, how many Japanese movies like I watch a lot mm-hmm. of like 70s Japanese or even newer Japanese stuff. that you know, it's not necessarily easily to come by in the States without just ordering it. I mean, we have a region free Blu-ray player so we can watch. Yeah stuff so i mean i don't know if normal is the correct word but mm-hmm. all right do you have your um features list ready i have both lists ready nice all right i'll go first on the features you can go first on the ch- uh, the challenges so we decided to rank um our preference of movies now i did a lot of flip-flopping constantly on this so i mean there could still be flip-flopping i think i accounted for Things that were more rewatchable, things that like just a better movie in general than something else, even though I might have enjoyed it. So it's a whole hot podge of um, rating material. But OK, so for my features, my the lowly number 20 was Army of Shadows. Um, yeah, that was that was dull for me. Sorry for all those people who, all over Letterboxd who love that, which I still don't get um, in the mouth of madness. J. Edgar. Disobedience, Kronos, The White Ribbon, Ashes and Diamonds. It actually kind of rose in my mind a little bit. Um, he Got Game, A Touch of, Zen, a touch of Zen, Rumblefish, The Long Goodbye, Dodeskaden. I put The Duelist a little bit higher just because I think it might have some more rewatchability factor than I thought. Uh, Munich, The Untouchables, Kicking and Screaming, Mulholland Drive, Persona, Definitely my biggest surprise of the season. Uh, we need to talk about Kevin and Whiplash at number one because you need to go my tempo. All right. Um, I think we're going to have a couple-ish similarities. Uh, your number 19 was my number 20 uh, in the Mouth of Madness. Uh, at number 19, uh, The White Ribbon. Uh, 18, uh, we need to talk about Kevin, 17, Army of Shadows, 16, uh, Rumblefish, uh, 15, Ashes and Diamonds, 14, Kronos, 13, The Duelist, 12, Kicking and Screaming, 11, The Long Goodbye, 10, 
Mulholland Drive, nine, Disobedience, eight, The Duskadin, seven, A Touch of Zen, six, J. Edgar, five, Munich, four, Persona, three, He Got Game, two, The Untouchables, and one, We Are On the Same Tempo for <laughs> Once, <laughs> Whiplash. Wow, some surprises in there. I, disobedience pretty high for you. Um, Mulholland Drive a little lower. Uh, I mean, it was more of... There are a lot of these I wasn't really a fan of, and Disobedience just kind of it. It just kind of ended up there. I would probably watch it again before I watch some of the other ones, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, like the the top four, maybe Dedeskadin should have been higher than a couple of the other ones because it's Kurosawa, and I would probably rewatch it and get something else out of it. But I just like nothing happened in it, but you know, hey. <laughs> oh goodness, we'll get we'll get to some more movies where I think that nothing happens that everybody else disagrees. So <clears throat> everyone has their taste. All right, challenge movies. What um, what's your order? All right, I'm gonna preface this by saying the top five took me a really long time. Even no, the top seven, but specifically the top five, it took me a long time. Um. When I went to go make this, I was like, this movie is going to be number one, hands down. Mm -hmm. And then it ended up not being number one. So, um, so here we go. 19 is Dogville. I don't think that's a surprise. (laughs) Uh, 18 was Cube. 17 was Ivan's Childhood. (sighs) Uh, 16 was Blue Velvet. Uh, 15 was In Bruges. 14 was La Hine. 13 was The Last Temptation of Christ. Uh, 12 was Rudy. Uh, 11 was Tokyo Gore Police. 5 was Sweeney Todd, The Demon Barber of Fleet Street. 9 was Gangster Squad. Uh, 8 was Fanboys. And here we're going to get to the cream of the crop. 7 is T2. 6, Gangs of New York. 5, The Raid. 4, Ran. Three, Lady Snowblood. Two, Don't You Know It's Fargo. And number one, Star Wars, The Last Jedi. This is not directed by fucking J.J. Abrams. Okay. <laughs> yeah, putting this to, this list together, I definitely realized this was going to be, since these are our my favorite movies and your favorite movies, it was definitely going to be um, a battle of those. Um, all right, seven... We have 17, right? Should be 19. I'm missing one for every one, but the first one. Oh, wow. I wonder what I'm missing. Hmm, Maybe you'll spot it. All right. So the bottom of my barrel was fanboys. Um, Yeah, that one didn't work for me. Sorry. Fun, but uh, too dumb. Lady Snowblood. Gangs of New York. That was my pick. The Raid. Sweeney Todd. Ivan's Childhood. Goki, uh, Tokyo Gore Police, pretty fun time. Gangster Squad, now we're getting to the good stuff. Blue Velvet, Cube, In Bruges, Star Wars The Last Jedi, Dogville, Lahane, Last Temptation of Christ, Ran, and Don't You Know It's Fargo at number one. Because, yeah, you have to do it. I wonder what I missed. You I left missed out two Ivan's, movies? You left out Ivan's Childhood. No, that was 12. Okay. Did you do Star Wars? Star Wars was up there. That's at six. You didn't say Rudy. Oh, I missed Rudy. Rudy, where would I put Rudy? Um, oh, I, I loved Bruges? Rudy. I did do in Bruges, even though I didn't want to rewatch it. I, it was at seven. Rudy, I, it, Rudy would be very high. Um, I would probably put Rudy somewhere in between four and four and six. I'm really surprised Gangs is so low on your list. Yeah, that movie that's that's a movie where it's it's super long and it does like like okay, See, that's, get on with that's it. That's a long movie that's really good. I am a <laughs> I don't know which other one you missed. I was listening uh I don't know which other one you missed. Whatever. We we got there. That's so that's funny cuz I went down like that whole list and I should have had everything. Oh, I'll just say it's number five. 
Rudy. Okay. All right, moving on. All right, we are almost all set for season two. Yeah, we have tons more content to go. We're not done by any means. We have at least 11 episodes coming up, which means me and Joey. Okay, so we have an interesting uh, concept coming up where we're going to have theme episodes. So me and Joey will both have our, um, you know, have some stakes in in the ring each episode we're each gonna throw something out there to chew on and so there'll never be another episode like this to where it's like all justin's picks and you know we'll just get through all this long garbage right <laughs> well at least for this season there's not going to be the the i pick from your list and you do and then A you challenge, challenge me yeah um i mean we could go back to the challenge. Like, I feel like that, um, be something at least good to go back to potentially in the future. But I do like the theme idea, obviously, as I like to theme, uh, if you've noticed, I've tried to theme my, my quote to what I was doing the challenges to and that kind of yeah. stuff. So, um, plus this also only gives us 10, I guess we're going to do 11, um, based off of some conversations that you and I've had, um, at least 11, um, yeah. it'll give us a shorter season and hopefully maybe it's not going to take us a year <laughs> Um, yeah. to, so definitely to picking up, season. picking up some momentum. Uh, hopefully we won't have more episodes where we're an hour in and the whole thing crashes and we have to start over. God forbid. <sighs> yeah. Yep. <laughs> as we near, uh, as we pass two in the morning. All right. So get on with it. <clears throat> so my themes for next season, which will start in just a couple weeks or two weeks or whatever, when, when we, uh, we podcast next. Um, so one of mine is um, a great movie that you've never seen. We'll, we'll be talking about an epic, which we're definitely split, splitting into two parts because I think initially when we looked at how long it was going to, how much movie we had to watch for this, I think we had 18 hours worth of movie. I think we've skinnied that since into 19 or 9 10, or no, 12, 13, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. It's going to be 16 hours worth of movie, I think. Um, a favorite movie, which is going to be fun. Um, a movie that you hated the first time, but you wanted to give another shot. And, and then... I'm going to interject here. You, I can't wait for you to see the movie that I picked here. Because you're going to be shocked, I think. Or maybe ah. you want, since you just said you're never shocked by me anymore. But continue. <laughs> okay. I guess it means it's not Japanese. <laughs> no, it's, it's definitely not Japanese. All right, and then a crit. Um, oh, wait a minute. That that's the hated one. Yes, the hated one. Oh, okay. I I'm sorry. I was ahead of the game on Criterion. Uh, Criterion that you know nothing about. So, what are your picks or what are your themes? Uh, for the record, I have no Japanese movies in my list. I do have foreign movies, but none of them are Japanese. Surprisingly, um, I have. Uh, since you did Criterion, I went with an Arrow title that you know nothing about. Um, I went since this is a big deal now, and now it's an even bigger deal than when I made the when, when I made this a streaming service original. Um, yep. Movie starring a favorite actor or actress, a musical or a music based movie, and then a movie that got snubbed in some way during award season. Now I think Joey has everything his of his locked in. I have one or two picks for each one of those, so I have a little bit of flexibility. But we're going to unveil them as we go along just to give added flexibility because we don't want to be locked into the same movie for a year again. <laughs> Poor kid uh, on the screen. Yeah, and I've, I've changed some of mine, um, especially okay. since we've changed <laughs> one category already, which now the categories are locked. But uh, it's led yeah. me to change. I've changed a couple. I actually thought about changing one during this episode. Um, back to one, to, back to a movie I changed it from, but didn't. So we'll see, um, as it goes. All right. So our next episode, Joey is your pick and I know what right. it is because I had to pick a movie for it. All right. So we're going to do the musical category. Um, and as you can see, we're not, I'm not going to pick just from Justin's side. We're going to pick from whatever side we want. Right. So I'm going to pick musical, which is from my side. And uh, so I will unveil or uh, unveil my movie from that. And uh, to keep with my theme of tying stuff together. So I gave <laughs> I you a so. quote from from La La Land. It's not La La Land because I've seen that already. And Justin's oh. seen that. Um, okay. But it is the Umbrellas of Cherbourg. Oh, which, good. Um, 
which is a criterion, but I did pick it um, because I've wanted to see it because it is apparently a humongous influence on La La Land. Ah. So I just recently watched a criterion special feature thing about um, that movie. And yeah, it sounds very interesting. I'm, Ooh, I'm super excited to have an excuse to watch that. And now Justin's pick for an unconventional um, musical. Although Joey's pick was also unconventional. We're not watching anything like West Side Story or anything like that. Okay. So I wanna, we're going to go back to Lars von Trier land. And we're going to see one of my favorite Lars von Trier musicals. It's, it doesn't seem like a musical at first, but it's a musical. And we're going to be watching Dancer in the Dark. Starring Bjorn. Uh, Bjork. The Icelandic singer. And a very unconventional musical, which it's definitely not a feel good time, but it's a real time. And I hope you find some appreciation for it because I sure did. So Dancer in the Dark and The Umbrellas of Shorebor. Is that how you pronounce it? Shorebor? Yeah, I think so. Shorborg, something like this French. Okay. And so. Or probably Shorebor. After what should we go with after that? Well, that'll be up for you to decide in the next episode. Um, well, I'll announce it now of what, you know, what direction we're going in. And I guess we'll go with the direct, whatever way the arrow points. So we'll go uh, episode two of um, season two will be an arrow title that you don't know about. So. All right. Are we going to go ahead and reveal them? Or are we going to wait? No, it'll be we we'll unveil, unveil that next time. Okay. So we're going to go with an arrow title. Okay, cool. Yep. All right. Thanks so much that for everyone that's following the show, bared with us this long. I'm not sure how long we've been going since, um, actually, since I restarted the counter, we're already at two and a half hours. So there you go. A longer episode, but it was worth it. It was the season one finale. Um, so yeah, hopefully uh, we'll keep this trainer rolling and have tons of, uh, you know, you have any comments for the show send them our way we'd love to hear about it yeah just uh if you do want to send us any comments or an- have us answer any questions you know it's the average joe's movie club cast at gmail.com we're on letterbox we have a facebook page just um on letterbox it's our personal letterbox pages but please hit us up ask us any questions we'd love to have some uh some feedback to start off the next season. Thank everybody so much for sitting through 20 episodes with us. Um, (laughs) I never thought we'd get this far. Um, and I'm really, really stoked that we have. Um, and I'm really stoked to be starting another season, um, to talk about movies and to see where this goes, um, even further. Nice. All right. Happy movie. Happy movie watching everyone. Cheers. Goodbye. Thank you so much. Just might be my mason.